301, June 26th, and roll call. Ms. Snell? Here. Ms. Matoye? Here. Ms. Fleur? Here. Mr. Davenport? Here. Ms. Franco? Here. Ms. Black? Ms. Yelsey? Here. Dr. Navarro? Here. Hold on one second. Is. Got it. Yours isn't working because you're not supposed to be talking. Oh, wow. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, do we have any public comments? No cards. No cards. No cards. No cards. No cards. Okay. So, we will um, go into closed session. Um. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order uh, June 26th at 6.03, 6.04 p.m. <laughs> and we're going to start with the opening ceremonies, a moment of reflection, and pledge followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, led by Martha Fleur. Oh. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so this is our first evening of casual wear, <laughs> starting the summer out. So that's why we're so casual. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, the first item is adoption of agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, it is moved by Ms. Fleur and seconded by, was that? Mr. Davenport. Mr. Davenport. I thought I heard two voices. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the, next is the adoption of minutes of uh, June 12th and June 18th. So moved. Second. <clears throat> okay, it is moved by Ms. Matoye and seconded by, oh, there you uh, Mrs. by Franco. Franco. <laughs> Mrs. Franco. I don't like doing this. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I have to repeat everything. For those that haven't been to a meeting before, I see a lot of new faces. Now that we're having our, um, videos um, transcribed um, we have to repeat every, I have to repeat everything so I'm not crazy okay moving on <laughs> um, to the reports the first report is on the district English language learner advisory committee DLAC and Vanessa President Snell, Dr. Navarro, members of the board, cabinet, guests. I'm very pleased tonight to introduce to you our DLAC board, as well as um, some people who help us along the way. Um, they're going to give our annual DLAC board report and share some of the highlights and thank yous. And we'll let everyone know that the uh, translated copy and the English version will be on our DLAC webpage. So you'll be able to find the full report there. So right now what I'd like to do is introduce a few uh, very important people. We have Jacqueline Gaitan, and she is a school community facilitator who works as with us here at the district office, and she supports our um, DLAC. And then we also have Miriam Munoz, and she is one of our DLAC co-chairs. And then um, Marbella Venegas could not join us tonight. But they're going to come forward and say a few words. Okay. President, um, Dr. Navarro, members of the board, I am uh, glad uh, that the board member and the district administration follow uh, the recommendation from last year of hiring a new community facilitator for the district office. We are looking forward to uh, working an amazing school year 2018-2019 with a positive relationship between emerging bilingual parents and the families and the school district. And right now I am happy to introduce Miriam Munoz, the co-chair president of the DLAC. Thank you. Um, like, my name is Miriam Munoz. 
I'm a mom of two, three wonderful kids. Uh, two are attending at Newport Heights Elementary School, second grader in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. It's my pleasure to be here and just explaining a little bit like what's going in this a year 2018. Uh, just I like uh, to say something. I'm from Mexico, like you know my accent. Yeah. I've been here for almost 11 years. I have a career. I have a master's degree in marketing, so I love, I love to work. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I truly believe in family and education. So in parenting, in, in parenting. So I like to say thank you to Vanessa Gurley and uh, Jacqueline mm -hmm. and Javier is outside translating everything for us. They're doing an amazing job for us. Thanks to them, we can understand what's going on our schools with our kids and all these new programs we have, like math, you know, reading level and, uh, and all these good things happening in our schools. Um, and this past year, we 25, we have 20 sc 25 schools enrolled on ELEC. So that's a good number and that we, uh, we have like average like around uh, 45 people who show up in these meetings every once a month. We do eight meetings right in front and we talk about all the needs and um, Vanessa, they always, and Jackie, they always bring like super good uh, people who came to us, like directors, you know, uh, community, fa community faci facilitators, they be with us all the time. They, uh, they show up at the first meeting and then like, for example, right now, Marcy, she's been in every meeting we had. So she's amazing, and I think she, um, w she loves to work with us, and we can feel it. Mm. Like, uh, I would love to be more involved this year. I've been here for a year. And I really like to ask you guys, and I asked Vanessa before, I feel like I want like you guys can empower me and work more with my, my community. So maybe I can go and attend with different ELACs mm -hmm. at the different idea. schools, right? That way I can be more close to them mm -hmm. and see where is the exactly needs. Mm -hmm. Because every school, it's different. It's not the same a, a, a privilege to be at Newport Heights, but it's not the same needs mm -hmm. at Wither School. Mm -hmm. See, so it's like a world so different. So I love to be more in, to, in, to, in touch mm -hmm. with all these communities, my community, and see which ideas, you know, like I'm here and I feel great. <laughs> I can see you guys and, and, and I feel like, oh, how about maybe more people can be here like me? Mm -hmm. You know, like I know the kids, the kids from Newport Heights, or pardon me, the rep they do a report uh, like the, I mean, they, they came here once a month, you know, they give you a report, mm -hmm. you know, like yes. PTA. Mm -hmm. exactly. Like how about Ella can come here and talk mm -hmm. to you too. Mm -hmm. Right, like, oh, this is going on with us. And we, we have a meeting once a month and we talk a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I feel like if we come here, I think once a, once a year, but maybe we can have more time. That's my recommendation mm -hmm. and thank you for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. So you can see we have um, passionate parent leaders in our district English Learner Advisory Committee, and we're so thankful that we have um, members who have been here for uh, a few years, mm -hmm. uh, just a few years, and some who've been here a very long time. And, it, and unfortunately, again, Marbella could not join us. She is known in our community. Mm -hmm. She's a legend. <laughs> She's recruited many families to come to DLAC and ELAC, but she was with one of her children all day registering them for college at Cal State Fullerton. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that that was very important. Um, but I also do want to recognize um, Carmen Ramirez. Ramirez. She's a, our, one of our co-secretaries and a long-standing member of our DLAC. So we want to thank her. 
And then we have a little small token of appreciation for um, for the, the board members who came here tonight. And just again, we want to thank them for their passion and their commitment. They're here every meeting, and um, they're always asking, can we do more? Can we do more? And they really want to serve our whole community. So we're very appreciative. So on behalf great. of Newport Mesa, we'd really like to thank them for their commitment. And thank you for your support. Uh, I just wanted to say, I know a couple of us have comments up here. Um, I, so I read the report and I thought it was a brilliant idea for DLAC to go out, the co-chairs to go out, or any members that wanted to go out and visit the other ELACs because obviously they can learn from you and you can do a little recruiting for your, for your DLAC board as well, right? You always wanna do that. And um, I wanted to ask, you had a, several really good suggestions, and I don't have it right in front of me right oh. now. How are we going to, are we addressing some of the suggestions that they, they made? in the report. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we we'll, we meet with the DLAC board um, before each meeting, and then we also work with them when we do our annual needs assessment, mm -hmm. and we present the findings to the rest of our DLAC so that they can hear what the recommendations were, and we talk through that, and we see um, how we can best meet those needs. Okay. One of the major ones this year was um, hiring Jacqueline and mm -hmm. making sure that we had someone to really dedicate the time and, and be mm -hmm. there to support them. Mm -hmm. And you are welcome anytime, and, uh, and I, we have a couple board members that come to your DLAG meeting, but it would be nice for more, more of us to attend and um, so we know what's going on. Uh, Mrs. Floor. Uh, yes, um, I particularly like that, that concept of, of having them make a report out every, either every month or every other month, and perhaps you can bring back a proposal of how, what that would look like and, mm -hmm. and what they would be reporting on, um, very similar to what a PTA does. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really very important and it's a really sound recommendation and I would hope that you would take that back and take that to them and what does it look like and, and bring back a proposal mm -hmm. so we could um, start that process because I think it's a great that idea. That is a great idea. Even have a, yeah, have a different ELAC come each month. That would be good. We welcome the opportunity. Yeah, great. that would be Thank great. You. Any other comments? I was just gonna mm -hmm. um, thank Vanessa mm -hmm. and Claire as well yeah. and um, Jacqueline. You just did an amazing job. And, um, and the parents enjoyed coming, they felt listened to, and, um, I, and they all got 100% attendance <laughs> certificates. Mm -hmm. And there are like over 40 parents that show up every single month and, uh, and they come, you know, they're very genuine Mm -hmm. and with their concerns and um, and they they're not just for their own child but they're coming for the entire school in that in most cases their community and the district and they show that all the time they ask that question so well, thank, so you. thank you. I, th yeah. I think um, one of the assets that we really do have in our in our organization is our school community facilitators, mm -hmm. and they really are the, the boots on the ground working with the ELACs and encouraging people to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so helpful to have them at our meetings, and I know it's such a dedication of time, so we're especially appreciative for them. And I, of course, am always appreciative for Claire. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Matoya. And, and it's a testament to what great meetings you have that the increase in p attendance this mm -hmm. year was significant. Mm -hmm. And I've read some of the topics and who's been coming out. Mm -hmm. And if I were a parent, I would want that meeting and I would want to come too to hear straight from the horse's mouth what's mm -hmm. going on. So mm -hmm. well done, all of okay. you. Well mm -hmm. done. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Oops. Um, so moving on to 10B, report on school and workplace safety. Mr. Lee Sung. Okay, good evening. Good evening. Uh, as promised, uh, three months ago when uh, Dr. Navarro on the board asked me to take a look and focus on safety in our district, uh, we've been very busy and I'm here to give you a full comprehensive report on what's been happening over these last three months related to safety. And that's the first part of the, the report tonight. The second part is I want to share with you in detail uh, the Orange County Grand Jury 
uh, report related to school safety in all the school districts in Orange County. And they left uh, all of the districts with nine uh, areas uh, of findings and nine recommendations. And I've been uh, having discussions with a lot of groups of individuals to get some input on how we would respond to those. And I want to share that uh, with you and to receive some input on those recommendations. So starting with uh, workplace uh, and school safety, uh, this is a slide I shared with you uh, a couple months ago and talks about our priority will always be uh, safety for our students and a very close second is safety for our employees and visitors. Uh, how do we accomplish that? Uh, we've been doing that by looking at uh, being proactive and prepared and working together in partnerships. Uh, the action steps originally were short term, but I included in here some uh, steps that would be considered maybe more long term and some that are ongoing, so I broadened that. And I wanted to give recognition to the fact that we have uh, a lot of partners uh, that have come forward. And as you can imagine, in this environment where safety is so critical, uh, there have been a lot of partners that have been reaching out to us. We've been reaching out to them in collaboration. And starting with our law enforcement, both in the city of Costa Mesa and the city of Newport Beach, we have great partnerships there, and that has continued at even deeper levels. Uh, the other thing that we did was put together a committee of representatives from NMFT, CSEA, NMAA, and of course district officials where we have talked regularly about safety and receiving input, uh, including some of the recommendations that you'll see from the Orange County uh, Grand Jury. Uh, we received some very uh, insightful input from this committee. And of course our management team and, and site principals. ASKIP and Keenan are two agencies that work very closely with our districts in the area of workers' comp and our liability. Uh, we also were able to have a meeting with the director of the National School Safety Center, Dr. Ron Stevens, uh, and that was paid for out of our uh, partnership with ASKIP. Um, FBI, OCAYAC, Homeland Security, they are offering a lot of workshops that we um, uh, attend and many of our staff uh, attend regularly and ongoing. Uh, our Orange County Office of Education and of course our safety consultant Vlad Anderson all contributes as great partners. Uh, the first category that I shared before was positive school and work environment, that of all the, re uh, all the research, it starts with this. And uh, as you know, we are required to do uh, sexual harassment and hostile work environment training. The big shift this year is that uh, we have shifted to an in-person training, which really gives us uh, more opportunity to go in depth with our management team. Uh, next, uh, we're continuing our efforts and we continue to grow in the area of PBIS and our uh, Student Services Division uh, continues to do great work with our sites in that area. Uh, emotional behavior support, as we all know, is a major area of attention when it comes to school safety. And uh, we had reported and had a study session not too long ago on challenge success. And as we all know, Challenge Success is a organization out of Stanford uh, University, and they are going to be partnering with Corona Del Mar High School next year, uh, where we're really going to be looking on balancing uh, the stress uh, that a lot of our students uh, experience in this, uh, in this academic environment. But we also had Challenge Success now complete training at all four of our comprehensive sites. So we're very pleased with that continued partnership. Uh, another thing that Student Services wor is working on is we've already had a very extensive risk threat assessment uh, process, but now it is being uh, turned into a team model. So again, this is the evolution of how we assess and manage uh, risk. And with the board support, we are very pleased to announce that uh, we have added four additional psychologist positions for 1819. And I just learned this week that we have already uh, posted those and hired four outstanding individuals to add to our already amazing team. 
The next area is school resource uh, officer program. Uh, we have had this program for about 15 years uh, in our district, both in partnership with Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. Uh, again, with the commitment of the board, we are committed to increase that. And we're working uh, with both cities to add one SRO uh, in, in each city. So we would have three in each city. We would have coverage at all of our high schools, then five days a week, and more coverage for our elementary schools. We're very pleased about that. Uh, we had heard back three months ago that we wanted to see more visibility of our SROs in the elementary schools. So we made sure that we conveyed that message and made sure that all of our elementary schools had visits uh, by our SRO. Uh, we also have completed uh, training and drills related to a an active intruder scenario on top of our lockdown drills with all of our schools in partnership with our SROs. Safe physical environments is another uh, uh, major area. And I did make this statement very clear last time that we certainly want to maintain a welcoming environment, but we need to do so with safety in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have three projects underway this uh, summer at three of our elementary sites, looking at fencing and also reconfiguring our offices to make sure there is one uh, single entrance into the site. We also conducted a site safety review at all school sites uh, with a, a team, uh, including Tim Holcomb, Tim Marsh, uh, Vlad Anderson, our safety consultant, and an architect to look at all of our school sites with the focus on ingress, egress, check-in, and perimeter. Uh, and then finally, we are, uh, we'll come back to the board with a recommendation uh, on that um, uh, site safety review and the findings there. And then finally, we have received a lot of ideas and suggestions. Okay. And as we committed, uh, we would take all of those downs. We want to look at and consider everything. Uh, there were quite a few uh, suggestions. And again, we will vet that, we will research that and come back with some of the best recommendations and include that in our plan. Continue on in safe physical environments. Uh, we also emphasize, re-emphasize uh, the importance of identifying individuals mm -hmm. on our school and work sites. And uh, we also reminded employees that we do have ID cards and that we want to make sure that they wear their badges on a daily basis. So again, a renewed effort and focus on that. Uh, we're also looking, and hopefully at our next board meeting, we will make a recommendation for a new visitor and volunteer management system <laughs> that we can implement district-wide mm -hmm. so that there are standard procedures throughout all of our school and work sites when any visitor comes uh, to visit us. Next is communication systems. Uh, we created, and with the with the help and guidance of Annette Franco, uh, we have now a web page dedicated to safety. And some good information on there. We'll continue to add information uh, throughout the year. We also created an internal written communication system. When it comes to safety, we want to make sure that we have uh, those memos, those bulletins very clearly identified so that it gets the uh, proper attention from all school employees. Uh, the last board meeting, we talked about uh, having a district-wide emergency communication system. And we're very pleased to have uh, one of our own graduates have created a company and really creating a state-of-the-art emergency communication system that we will be rolling out uh, this summer and in the fall to all of our uh, staff as well as our parents. And I put a little notation on there that that will be our emergency communication system, but Blackboard will be, uh, continue to be our non-emergency uh, system communication. And that will definitely uh, give a clear message of what is an emergency and what is a non-emergency to anyone receiving that. Uh, we've conducted training and communication drills. One of the things that I, I have realized is the importance of having drills, uh, not uh, just at the sites and evacuating or doing fire, but also just doing communication. Because we know in a real emergency, uh, that is always one of the, the greatest challenges. 
Uh, we had a concerted effort to get updated information from our parents because if we have an emergency communication we want to send out, we want to have the most accurate and updated contact information. We also did a complete inventory of all radios, two-way radios that we have uh, on site. And uh, we are going to be creating a minimum standard for all sites so that we ensure that at minimum certain individuals, key individuals at the site always have two-way communication uh, with the front office. Drills, drills, and more drills. Mm -hmm. um, we conducted uh, the lockdown active intruder training at all of the sites and, and we started doing that here in the workplace as well. We reviewed and clarified emergency proce procedures related to our alarm and alert systems. So again, getting better at understanding how our fire system work, intrusion alarms, and our phone and PA systems. We also uh, plan to update and enhance reunification procedures. And this is an area we've identified that over the summer uh, we want to review that and again have a renewed communication with our sites and our parents so they know what happens in the event of emergency. If we can't reunite them with their students at the site, where else can we uh, meet up and, and uh, have them reunite? And finally, again, taking our emergency drills up to higher levels, more intricate levels, where we would have drills for various different scenarios. Here's something new. I mentioned this at the last board meeting, that we have created a uh, guidelines uh, related to those school days that we have excessive heat. And just a little background, uh, first of all, uh, the district has started uh, to install HVAC beginning back in 1314. And this summer, we have six schools that will have uh, HV or AC installed. Uh, next year, we will have five elementary schools and one middle school uh, set for installation. And that will leave the two uh, high schools with approximately 50% of the rooms, uh, which they're scheduled to have installation done in 2020 and 2021, which would mean in 2021, all of our schools will be air conditioned. Fully air conditioned. So to the guidelines. So we have been doing these procedures for, for many, many years. As you know, we've had a lot of schools without air conditioning for many years. But these are the things that sites have been doing, but we did put it in a memo format. Uh, the first category is we give sites discretion to limit, minimize, postpone, or even cancel physical activities if there is excessive heat. The other thing we do is we allow modification to the instructional programs, subjects, or activities. So sometimes, rather than teaching a heavy subject in the afternoon where it's hotter, to shift that subject matter uh, in the morning when it's cooler, and then do some lighter activities in the afternoon. Another uh, uh, area is changing locations. In every school site, there are some areas that are cooler and some that are warmer. So allowing sites to move folks around, group them together into cooler areas. The next area is, is the importance of staying hydrated. All the research says that our children, they don't feel the effects of dehydration. So we have to constantly make sure water's available and remind them to, to drink. Uh, and then finally, uh, keeping classes cool. Certain things like you know, close the blinds, keep the, the, the direct sunlight out, whatever we can do to keep the, the classrooms as cool as possible. But we've added another area, and this is something we had not done before, is we will uh, do an early release for those elementary and middle school sites without air conditioning, which again, after this summer, will only be five elementary schools uh, and a couple of high schools left. Uh, but here's the criteria. First of all, the forecasted temperature would need to reach 95 degrees and a heat index of 103. I believe I was asked the question of where did those numbers come from last meeting, and those, that's modeled after uh, San Diego uh, School uh, District. And the important thing is that we would make that determination by noon, the day prior that we went and act that. 
Okay, and I think that's very critical so that we can <coughs> notify parents, we can notify staff, we can notify departments such as transportation and food services so that we can make the, the adjustment. And the early release would be approximately two hours before the normal release time. Okay, so, the, so if we get to the point where it's excessive heat, we have many uh, options that sites can do, and if need be, we would do the early release if it reaches this high level. So finally, for this part of the, of the presentation, uh, just a reminder, our most important outcomes, uh, we want everybody to know what to do, and that way they feel empowered and not fearful. We want everybody to have ownership, feel that ownership and responsibility for safety, and again, everyone caring or, or working together for that caring environment. So this is a message I've been relaying to as many groups of people who will have me. Uh, I've been conveying that. Uh, we have a lot of support, a lot of very interested people to keep everybody safe. So now moving into the next part, which is the Orange County Grand Jury Report. Okay, The report is called Safer Schools, What Can We Do? And I'll give you a little background. The study began actually at the start of the school year that has just completed. Uh, th this was before a couple of the major school shootings that occurred. They were already looking at this. And it involved all Orange County school districts, and they focused on access, identification, and visitors. And they left nine findings and nine recommendations, which I'll share with you in just a moment. And the requirement is that every district needs to respond by August 1st. So with you, is uh, where I believe our response should be at this point and certainly open to uh, hear your input. But the, in the area of the findings, these were our two choices. One is we can agree, or two is we can disagree partially or wholly. So those are our two choices for these um, findings. The first finding is this. School safety and security are priorities in every school district in the Orange County public school system. Okay, so they just make a declarative statement, mm -hmm. and do we agree, do we disagree? I think this one is a fairly easy, yeah, I think we can agree. Okay, and I'm gonna go through these rather quickly. It's the recommendations I wanna spend a little more time on. Number two okay. is the implementation of security measures for schools in many cases is limited by funding. Yes, of course, we wish we would have much more funding, and hopefully mm -hmm. the legislator will do something in the area of school safety for all school districts. Mm -hmm but I put down here our proposed response would be to agree. Mm -hmm. Finding number three, many Orange County school campuses were constructed to reflect an open and inviting atmosphere, but are now faced with physical and philosophical security issues that challenge this thinking. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly the case for many of our schools here. And again, I think that is a factual statement and I propose that we agree. Number four, while every Orange County school district reported the use of campus visitor sign-in process, there is a lack of procedural consistency among school campuses. Mm -hmm. And I think that is mm -hmm. accurate, not only for our school district, but others, and again, something that we're working towards to make it standardized. So I put here that we would agree. Number five, many districts or school campuses do not require all teachers, staff, and volunteers to wear ID badges while on campus, making identification of authorized personnel difficult for substitute teachers, student teachers, visitors, volunteers, and first responders. Again, that is a challenge. Again, something that we uh, have in place that we need to continue to uh, enforce. Finding number six, currently student ID badges, which could easily distinguish students from non-students of similar age, mm -hmm. are not required to be worn by Orange County That's middle true. and high school students. And that is a true statement. Mm -hmm. Again, whether we agree with this or not, that'll come a little bit later on the recommendation mm -hmm. side. Number seven, campus personnel and volunteers while on duty outside the classroom have an inconsistent usage or availability of communication devices for emergency situations. And again, we believe that is probably very true in many of the schools and districts. Number eight, there is no documentation or reporting protocol within districts of individual campus security incidents, making it difficult to track, analyze, and summarize such incidents. Again, believe that that to be an accurate statement. And number nine, while every Orange County school develops a school safety plan, few schools have used an individual school 
security assessment to identify deficiencies or to develop the required plan. And again, I think that is, mm -hmm. uh, is out there. <laughs> okay, so, so I do propose our response would be that we do agree with each of those. Where we get to the recommendations, they give us four choices. And the four choices are the first one is implemented. Okay, that's their response language. I put in the parentheses what that means is we're agreeing to it and that we've completed it. Okay. okay. Number two uh, is not yet implemented. That would mean we agree, but it's in progress. And number three is requires further analysis. So in other words, we're not sure yet. We need to look into this further. And number four is not warranted or reasonable, therefore we disagree with this. Okay, so those are four choices. Starting with recommendation number one. School districts should explore all possible funding resources that may be available in order to implement desired security measures. So again, that's something that we think we should do. Look at all possible sources, working with Jeff Trader. Mm -hmm. And so our recommended response here would be not yet implemented, so we agree, and that that's in, in progress. Okay. okay. Number two, school districts should reevaluate the lack of secure fencing on all school campuses and present a report to the respective boards by December 31, 2018, outlining their plans to make campuses more secure. As you know, we're well ahead of this one, mm -hmm. and so we will bring back to the board a report and uh, come up with a, a plan. So for this one, again, I would say not yet implemented. Recommendation number three, school districts should implement procedures to ensure that all campuses maintain a complete daily log of every visitor or volunteer entering or exiting the campus, excluding events such as award ceremonies, stage, or musical productions. So if we adopt a visitor management system, we provide the training and we make it district-wide, I believe we can accomplish this. So our proposed response would be that we agree, but that would be in progress until we get that completed. Number four, school districts should implement procedures to ensure that photo identification is required of all campus visitors and volunteers before a visitor's badge <coughs> is issued, okay? So this one, when, when I met with various groups and we talked through this one, there are some logistical issues with this. Mm -hmm. Certainly it makes sense to, to require a photo ID of anybody who comes onto campus. That makes sense. But sometimes schools, we know our parents. That's what I'm hearing. We know our parents. We know who they are. This seems kind of overkill for that. And uh, so there's some logistical issues that we would want to work out. And what happens if there is an emergency and a, and a parent or a guardian or someone on the emergency card doesn't have that photo ID? So that's why we're uh, proposing at this point that we need to analyze this and have further analysis. Number five, <clears throat> school districts should implement procedures to ensure that all faculty and staff are required to wear visible photo ID badges while on campus. Mm -hmm. And this one we're proposing is already implemented. Number six, all school districts with middle or high school campuses should consider using student ID cards in a format to be worn as student ID badges while on campus. Again, talking to site principals, talking to the safety committees. This is a hard one. <laughs> so again, sounds like a great idea. And are we going to be uh, constantly haggling over where's your ID, you know, you're violating a rule, those things tend to escalate. So it, it's, this one is, again, on the surface seems to be very uh, pr uh, practical, but on the other hand, we don't want to create more problems when we should be focusing on other things. However, if these ID cards become essential for food, uh, food services, for library, for a lot of different things, then it becomes essential that they have it. Mm -hmm. At that point, it could become much more of a, a doable reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, this one is further analysis. Number seven, school districts should evaluate available communication devices and ensure that custodial and supervisory personnel, as well as safety resource officers, playground supervisors, coaches, have two-way radios or equivalent communication devices with them at all times, enabling instant two-way communication with the office. We like this one. 
Many of our schools are already there. Uh, we did that inventory. There's a few areas where we need to add some additional radios, but we believe we can get there uh, come uh, this, this opening of the new school year. So this one is not yet implemented. Number eight, school districts should consider requiring that all campus incidents of unauthorized access be recorded, tracked, and reported to the district office on a quarterly basis. All districts should share these reports with the Orange County Department of Ed. So this one, further analysis, we would like to be able to see exactly what is the definition of unauthorized access. Uh, so there's a lot of questions surrounding mm -hmm. this. So again, we would like to take a slower approach to let's further anal uh, analyze this, let's get some feedback from our, our County Office of Education and, and proceed very carefully with this one. Okay. And the last one, school districts should evaluate requiring each school to perform a school security assessment to evaluate their current school safety plan. Again, I think um, uh, it makes sense. We wanna have a standard evaluation instrument We'd like to be able to see that. We would like to be able to pilot that uh, before we, we proceed. So again, here's another area that it's not that we're adamantly opposed. We need more information. So our recommendation and proposed response would be further analysis. So those are the nine recommendations uh, at this point. Uh, if there's any, th and, and by the way, I did provide a sheet here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all of them are on there for your reference. But if there's any questions or input on any of those, I will try to answer them. Okay, Mrs. Floor. Yeah, I, I, I find it interesting that on the first page they're finding and they're finding it, really, some, some of them are per school. Um, for example, F9, it says every Orange County school develops a school safety plan. And um, I think the failure of the, of, the, of the Orange County Grand Jury is to realize that that's not a school, um, responsibility, that's a school district responsibility to ensure that every school within their district has that. And I see that they've corrected it because R9 is mentions it's a school district. So it's a sort of an inconsistent on that portion. Um, and the only other thing is I find it interesting that in R3, they talk about award ceremonies, stage or musical productions, but fail to mention sporting events <laughs> like football, which are, which by and large, that occurs more often Far, yeah. than, than award ceremonies and or stage or musical productions. And so I would hope that you would just make a note that somewhere along there that, so. Right. I, I think the intent was uh, exactly. it, it would be any, any type of event. Mm -hmm. They just, the, the list obviously wasn't, in, uh, you know, exclusive of, of everything or okay. inclusive of everything. Mrs. Matoye. And on R3, oops, that went away. <laughs> um, school districts should implement procedures to ensure that all campuses maintain a daily log, blah, 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 blah. Did we put agree in progress? Is that because we're going to try to get a consistent method at every school? Because I know every school has it. Mm -hmm. They have yeah. something. And because I go out to the schools and there's a sign-in log for every school, but they're different colors or different right. places. And so we said in progress because we're trying to make it consistent. Yeah, correct. And, and, and that's the thing. We have a check-in process at every school site currently, uh, but it is in various forms. And what this is asking is that we maintain a historical log hmm. of everybody. And, and that's hard when you're doing paper, pencil, uh, type of, of sign-ins. So this would be a digital system and I it would that. maintain that, yeah. Yeah, one of our school, I know Davis does that. That's, that's correct. Yeah. It's it's fun the first time and then afterwards you just put your name in and they, they know who you right. are and where you're going. It's yeah, our, our site folks and, and the committee, they, they, they love the idea of let's get a district-wide system and it, it's I think it's very beneficial to parents too, mm -hmm. going from site to site to district uh, offices. Mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you. Mrs. Yelsey. Uh, yeah, I want to go from the grand jury back to our, our, sure. our safety plan, which, first of all, I want to thank you. I know you spent a lot of time with your committee going into all this. And as you've told us in the past, just for the public, <coughs> some of the things we do, we don't discuss in public. So Correct. there are other things that are being yeah. done. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we are doing is in the area of both physical safety and emotional safety, both equally important. 
I really appreciate adding our psychologists. Um, yes. I think we all agree that's terrific. Um, some of us serve on the SAR board and we still feel we need more social workers as well if whenever that's an option and yeah. Jeff Trader's Jeff, looking yes, down <laughs> right now and he's not listening, but <laughs> um, social workers and counselors as well. I think we're short in a lot of the schools on those. I think if you talk to the high schools, um, they feel they could use more counselors. Um, exactly. And I think that's it. And at the bare minimum, they stay until the end of the school year instead of leaving yes. in April. Because our, current, uh, well, our interns the, continue to yeah. our stay. Social but worker interns, it would be yeah. nice if they were extended till the end of the school year. But aren't those interns? And those are interns. interns and so but it they would be so hard, difficult to hold them back. So we have we to could have pay them. them. But, we could pay them. We would pay them? We would yeah. stipend them. Yeah, stipend them. Because our calendars um, don't match. I had a question about um, our eight. Um, I thought we did record all campus incidents mm -hmm. that of unauthorized exit. I mean, I, I just, could you explain that a little more? What aren't we doing? Well, th they're, they're asking for some kind of tracking system to, to be developed. Mm. And I think when you read the, the report in a little greater detail, what, what the idea is, is the sharing of information. So if you, uh. let's say you have an individual who tried to get on one school campus, and it could be in another school district. Oh. And then a day later or a couple of days later, the same individual tries to get on another school campus okay. mm. and so on. How, how do you know that there's a pattern right. brewing? Right. So this is kind of information mm. sharing in some kind of standard <coughs> format. Mm. Um, so, so uh, you know, currently we might keep track of it at the district level. Maybe uh, you know, Dr. Diagostino gets a report mm -hmm. from the site, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly that's not being shared district to Among district and throughout the county. Okay, okay that makes sense. And um, nine school districts should evaluate requiring each school to perform a school security assessment. Um, we do that. We, we, we do that in the form of every school site uh, has a school site council. <coughs> yeah. They evaluate their plan, they assess it, they up, update it. And, and we do too. So, 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 we, so we go through a process yeah. and we do it here at the district yeah. level with all of our sites. Uh, what this is, is taking that a step further that there would be some instrument or, or some process that almost like an external audit oh. of each of the individual mm. school sites using okay. a standard audit, uh, you know, protocol. Okay. Okay. And, and again, I, I think that might be a great idea. Mm -hmm. I would want to get more information and see uh, what that is and give us an opportunity to pilot that. Uh, and, and eventually, you know, if that could be standardized throughout the county, again, that, that's, uh, you know, uh, that, that would be a real positive. Right. Okay. Okay, yeah. That's I, what I got to think more county, yeah. exactly. not just Local. individual. Yeah. Okay, does anybody have any more no, questions? Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank great you. report. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. A lot of work. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, 10C, report on proposed updates to math pathways. Mr. Drake. We're waiting with bated breath. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Good evening, President Snell, Dr. Navarro, board members, mm -hmm. cabinet and guests. Um, it's, uh, it's nice to be back uh, mm -hmm. to share with you some updates uh, in okay. conversations and uh, both in listening to community uh, and working uh, for several hours with our uh, teacher leaders and administrative leaders uh, steering committee over the last week. Um, it, it's nice to come back and give you some updates and some of our thinking. <clears throat> um, two years ago, uh, as, as you know, you tasked us uh, as, a, as a group of educators um, to take a hard look at our math program um, and start with looking at our materials and going through processes uh, to adopt new materials. And we've done that. We've done that in a way under your direction where teacher voice 
um, uh, teacher expertise is really center to, to all of those decisions. Um, in 2016-17, we went through an extensive process, kindergarten through sixth grade, and our kindergarten through fifth grade teachers adopted Bridges in Mathematics. Um, and through that whole process, what we, what we attempted to do, and I think we were successful at, is we attempted to make sure that it wasn't just about materials, but it was about finding materials that were aligned to the expectations of our current standards. And we would do that collaboratively in building capacity of our teachers and administrators along the way so that we started to really get a picture, a clear picture, of what um, learning and teaching under the expectations of these standards really, really was all about and what it would look like. And we chose Bridges in Mathematics because we felt those materials gave us the best opportunity to meet those expectations. Continuing on to 17-18, this last school year, we went through the same process and built the same capacity with a group of, of um, middle school teachers, including sixth grade teachers who wanted to connect to that middle school experience. And at that point, our whole process uh, and our whole vision of creating a K-12 math experience really started to come to life for us. Um, and we really were able to look at what was happening in K-5 and connect that to our middle school. Um, as we were looking through materials. And in the end, our middle school teachers, along with our sixth grade teachers, recommended to you uh, at the end of last month, uh, illustrative math for adoption, and we've, we've been through that. Um, they're incredible materials, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then um, at the beginning of this year, our, our high school decided to step away <clears throat> from the adoption process because they wanted to make sure that they were living that K-12 vision um, and they wanted to make sure that they could connect with all the decisions that had currently been made K-8. The other part of this process that all kindergarten through uh, 12th grade teachers have been involved in is really stepping back and taking inventory not only of their individual classrooms but of our program. And when we're talking about our program, we're not just talking about materials. We're talking about materials, we're talking about instruction, we're talking about pathways, and we're talking about learning and what that all looks like and how we can actually improve that. Um, and it's a natural process, I think, for, for anyone um, in, in positions where you're trying to make something happen to step back and take that inventory and, and recognize that there are circumstances that have changed, and changed uh, over time and there are expectations that have changed over time. And those have to be considered and looked at deeply um, for risk of if you don't check those things out and really think deeply about those things, you're on the risk of falling behind. Um, and that's true, you know, not just in education, but I would venture to say that's true in business um, and the private sector as well. So we've done that, and, and we've approached it with the idea of can we improve. Um, I think it's also important to know the capacity that we built in relation to the expectations. And, and we talk about the expectations through the shifts um, that our standards are calling for. And those shifts are our focus, coherence, and rigor. Um, and and they're, they're integral in understanding um, directions that we need to go um, from the perspective of teachers and educators in our math pathways. Um, but for, without a doubt, K-8, um, there is focus standards at each grade level. But the, the focus standard at kindergarten remains a standard that is built on from kindergarten through eighth grade until it's mastered at that point. So there are no longer isolated incidents of learning. All of the learning kindergarten through eighth grade is connected. And that's the coherence we're talking about. And then rigor, which we'll get into a little bit more detail in a bit, is about a balanced approach. No longer are we just asking kids to be able to compute, right? But we're asking kids to understand math at deep levels, not just procedurally, right? Um, but being able to use their deep understanding to apply. They understand the concept of math and how to use it in certain situations. So no longer in K-8 math is it about going faster, but it's about going deeper. Um, and all of the research and all of our experience, both with the current materials that we have, um, what we've decided, and I'm saying we because I'm, I'm expressing teacher voice here, is that we cannot and we've got to commit to making sure that we provide a sound, solid foundation for every single one of our kids with the K-8 content in mathematics because it's that sound, deep understa uh, understanding of math that provides success in high school and beyond. 
So for the past four years, the numbers you see up here really relate to our accelerated pathway in middle school. The blue number up at the top, um, about 275, <coughs> 212 and 275 over the last four years is the number of students who have been in our accelerated pathway. It amounts to about 15% on average over the last four years of our uh, uh, sixth, seventh, or seventh and eighth grade students. Um, and just to make sure we're all on the same page, what an accelerated pathway looked like in middle school for the last four years is taking seventh and eighth grade um, content and putting it into one year and trying to teach that content in one year, um, over, two, well, over one year teaching two years of math content. And that, that would happen to select kids who are identified um, uh, through a multiple measure. Um, they were placed in that class and ultimately in eighth grade they would take math one. What we have found and as we've discovered and talked through this with teachers, um, that, this, that, the, that the acceleration that currently exists covers topics at twice the speed and not even close to half the depth that our, our standards uh, are, are expecting us to. Um, the, this speed or this, this um, acceleration is doable if your, primary, if your primary objective is to make sure kids know procedural math. And that's really one third of our primary objective and expectation and standards. Back to rigor, I think it's important just to reiterate that rigor does not mean harder and faster. It does not mean teaching topics at earlier grades. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, if we teach topics at earlier grades in relation to our current standards, we ruin that coherence of building upon previous knowledge that has been taught. So as it says in here, to help students meet the standards uh, in relation to rigor, educators will need to pursue with equal intensity, equal intensity, three aspects of rigor in the major works of each grade level, and that's the conceptual understanding, procedural skill and fluency, and application. And that needs to be balanced and equal. If we tilt one way or the other, right, we create gaps for kids. So rigor really is about college and career. It's about teaching and learning math at deeper levels that create fluent, flexible mathematicians who can problem solve, reason through math, communicate their thinking by drawing on deeper conceptual understanding and then applying that to their world, not just applying that to an algorithm. This is the expectation of our standards and really the expectations of college, colleges receiving our students as well as those students who are making career, to, career choices. They need to be able to do math uh, rigorously. When we talk about um, current situation and, um, and circumstances, the circumstance that we have with our materials is, is a really, really positive circumstance. Um, you've approved for us to adopt uh, illustrative math materials for our 6-8 program. They are the absolute highest rated materials in relation to alignment that we can find. Um, and the, the proof of that is in the ed reports, and we've talked about what those ed reports um, do, but they talk about how aligned are they to focus coherence and rigor and the mathematical practices that need to be incorporated for kids to be able to apply their deep level of understanding, procedural, conceptual, and application. Um, in those three areas of alignment, along with the mathematical practices, uh, what we've adopted has received a perfect score. Usability gets to that other question that we've been grappling with is, is are our teachers ready um, to make sure that, that kids, uh, that we're meeting the expectations? And I think teachers would be honest with you and say, we know a lot more than we did two years ago, but we have a long way to go. Um, that usability piece of this program relates to how it supports teachers supporting kids to meet the standards, and all kids from those who need additional gap filling to those who need um, enrichment and to go deeper. And it receives a near perfect score. That does not mean we don't have to continue to provide support for our teachers. We absolutely do and they're asking for it. And we will. Uh, let me go back for a second to this. The other part about the design of this that we found out, and this comes from the teachers, is that, that it is nearly impossible um, actually, I think the teachers would say impossible to cover two years of math, the way these materials are designed, in one year. Um, that's what the teachers would say. 
that that these these materials meet. Excuse that me. Rigor. Excuse me. You know, I, I I would just ask that we be civil here. Everybody is here for the kids. The ones that the, those of you sitting in the <coughs> audience, those of us that are here, the the teachers that have worked on this, the administration, Mr. Drake. So I would ask that you just try to. Um, Use some civility and do what you think you would um, expect your children to do if they were in this room. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Really, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So these materials really um, lend themselves to making sure that all of the seventh and eighth grade content in two years can be taught and learned at deep, deep levels to set that foundation for high school success and even beyond. So last uh, Monday, this was the initial proposal. Um, and we talked through and you gave lots of questions and direction to go back and continue the conversation. So our initial proposal was to make sure that we were setting that solid foundation for kids to have success in high school and beyond. Um, and we proposed that we provide all seventh graders um, with seventh grade math and all eighth graders with eighth grade math. Although going into next year, 1819, um, we would provide math one for those students who completed that accelerated pathway this year. Um, and then in both situations in seventh and eighth grade, for those students who needed um, additional support, <coughs> they would have their math, their, their grade level math class, and then an additional class of support to help them fill their gaps with the additional time and support. Um, ninth grade would be math one for all students, um, especially as we're um, piloting the illustrative math materials in ninth grade next year in our math one classes, and they will continue to run. Um, supplemental elective courses for students who, who need the intervention. Um, there's no way to propose this without recognizing that we're also going to have to address our high school pathways. Mm -hmm. And our teachers recognize that right away. Um, what our teachers are adamant about is making sure that kids come to them in high school with a solid foundation. And they're adamant about uh, moving that acceleration to the high school level and the high school pathways. That's what they want. Um, and that was our whole conversation. They recognized that over the next six, eight months, like we have over the last basically two years, we're gonna have to really dig in and research and look at what our options are to provide pathways for kids continuing on beyond um, that algebra <coughs> team, kind of gatekeeper for those kids who wanna get into those higher levels of math. We wanna still be able to provide that. Um, it's going to look different. There is no way, right, in high school math to do five years of math in four years without compressing. Um, and, and our commitment or the committee's commitment is to figure out how to do that best for our kids without accelerating at the middle school. After that proposal, we, we got lots of feedback um, and I wanna be open about it. We listened um, and we've thought about it and we've talked about it. And here are the three, I think, um, real uh, initial proposal objections to that, that um, initial proposal. One is that the lack of acceleration will bore or not challenge math, uh, math focused students. The other is the lack of acceleration in middle school results in lack of access, access to advanced mathematics like AP calculus, AP statistics in high school. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and that also classes not sorted by ability will be detrimental <coughs> to students with some objections that we got back. For example, um, advanced, advanced students will be slowed down or struggling students will be lost because the class is moving too quickly. So before I answer those, um, I want to let you know that, like I said, we spent uh, uh, probably all in all about six hours with the steering committee between last Monday and today um, and have come up with a different, a different proposal. Um, and the different proposal is not drastically different, mm -hmm. um, but it is different um, in, in addressing those objections. Mm -hmm. um, the first part of it would be um, in seventh grade math, to offer seventh grade math, and while we won't necessarily title it this, this is all we could come up with at this point, was a, se a math seven plus. Still committed, the committee is still committed to making sure that all of seventh and eighth grade content is taught at deep levels, and that's, mm -hmm. that commitment can only be reached in year to year progression of math in middle school. But that they recognize that if we can identify students who are those math focused students through objective, measurable criteria, um, that we can, we can 
cluster them in classrooms and provide them the same seventh grade content, but take them to deeper levels for even more success in high school and those higher levels of mathematics. Eighth grade, we would offer the eighth grade math to students and that math one, we would continue to offer for students uh, for who've completed the acceleration pathway this year. And ninth grade um, would be math one for all students and intervention support would be provided as an additional course um, for those students who needed that. Um, and then once again, the commitment is to make sure that students will still have the same access uh, to the higher levels of math in high school, but that's pathway work that we're gonna do over the next six to eight months. So addressing uh, objective number one, uh, you know, that idea that the lack of acceleration will bore or not challenge math-focused students. Um, I think this is a telling slide. This is really eighth grade math now. And a lot of the material that you're seeing in eighth grade math here um, in relation to what we need to teach and how we need to teach it um, is a lot of what used to be covered in high school. So there's, there's an enormous amount of algebra preparation here for those kids going into high school. Um, and, and really, it's not a matter of slowing down, but the expectations of our standards, as, you've can, as you can see here, and the expectation of what kids are able to do with the math has increased, uh, and we can't skip it. Um, much of eighth grade, like I've said, uh, much of these topics cover um, uh, many of those topics which in the past have been covered in high school. Uh, and with our current Math 7 plus option, we can take kids to deeper levels. Um, in their grade level content. This is just another example of, of it's not about doing more things with, or it, it is now about doing more things with fewer topics. Under previous standards, the expectations really were to be given mathematical situations and to just compute, to do the calculation, to, to memorize the formula, to plug in the numbers and to get an answer. The expectations of our new standards, our current standards are they're given a mathematical situation and they're required or, or uh, asked to fall back on their knowledge to set up the mathematics, to do the calculations, to interpret the results, and then to be able to communicate those results. And those are all pointing to college and career readiness. Um, lack of acceleration in middle school results in lack of access to advanced mathematics, AP calculus, AP statistics in high school. As I've stated several times, this is the work we have to do over the next, next six to eight months with the, the expert teachers and administrators um, is, is to create these pathways. There are examples, and I'm gonna show two examples, but I wanna be very clear, we have not committed to these two examples, but these are examples that show it can still happen. Um, giving kids opportunities at different points of time to make a decision for themselves and for the family to be involved in that decision that yeah, I'm ready now to jump into higher levels of math because they're a little bit more mature and a little bit more developmentally ready to help make those decisions with parents. So once again, these are not in stone. These are just examples, a graphic examples of how it could happen. So you see the pathway starts in seventh grade with math seven or math seven plus, plus and math eight leading into Math one as a ninth grader, math two as a 10th grader, and then as we have right now would be a decision point in 11th grade for kids. They could continue in that math three pathway and take a pre-calculus course their fourth year in high school, or they could jump into a combined class of pre-calculus and math three to then transition or, or, or move into in their, in their 12th year of uh, school into an AP statistics or an AP calculus class. So it's doable. Um, for, some, for some who currently are in those higher levels of math in um, 11th grade, there are options. Once again, not set in stone, right? But there are options to accelerate. Um, and actually I'd rather call it compress because we're not throwing anything out right, in, in this as an example. You'd start in math seven or math seven plus, math eight, math one, and for that, that STEM kid, that kid who's going to be an engineer, that kid who's going to be a doctor and who's going to go into those sciences, they have an option in 10th grade, potentially, if this is something we were to consider, to take math two and math three, but I wanna be clear and, and clear this up. It would be take a semester 
of Math 2, so first semester would be Math 2, and second semester would be Math 3. Very similar to what a lot of kids do in college. They take mm -hmm. the first math first semester, second math second semester. Mm -hmm. It would be double blocked. I want to be open and honest. Mm -hmm. It would be double blocked. That's mm -hmm. a decision that we have to make. Mm -hmm. Um, as you know, students and families, mm -hmm. that is it worth at that point in time potentially giving up an elective and double blocking it because they would have math every day for that semester to make sure that we're covering the year's content for math two and math three. Mm -hmm. And then their junior year they could transition into an AP stats or AP calculus class and their fourth year into an AP calculus or stats class depending on what they took. So it's doable. These are not the only ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just want you to, to see that it is possible to move acceleration or compression to the high school without eliminating options that currently exist for kids. It's different. Mm -hmm. But it also allows us to provide that solid foundation that all of our kids, we know all of our kids need um, that they get in, in, in middle school uh, and, and elementary school. So number three, the objective of, of number three uh, related to, uh, you know, classes uh, that are not sorted um, mm -hmm. could be a detriment to some kids. Um, I, I would go back to the slide, uh, those too many slides back, of the usability of the materials we've, we've adopted. Um, they lend themselves to teachers using them in a way that can meet all kids' needs, filling gaps for kids, um, EL learners as well as taking those kids who are ready um, to go deeper, they have access to do that and the ability to do that. Um, also recognize that with our, um, our current proposal, the adjustments we've made to the proposal, um, that there may be some students that want to work harder and be challenged um, on a regular basis. And based on these, on multiple measures that we would discover, these students can be placed in Math 7 plus courses. This is a significantly more rigorous version of Math 7. And remember, rigor doesn't mean harder and faster. Mm -hmm. It means deeper and balanced. Um, there will be more application, <coughs> deeper levels of conceptual understanding, and increased focus on the construction of mathematical, ar uh, of mathematical arguments. Um, and these will provide a firm foundation for students to be successful in advanced mathematics in high school and beyond. So what I'm uh, laying out for you is years of conversation um, and work and study um, from our teachers and administrators in saying that the foundation of, of content to set kids up for high school success and beyond are critical those middle years that we take kids as deep as we can in those concepts that translate into their algebraic learning and need in high school, along with setting them up for that, that college and career uh, experience. Okay, Mrs. Yelsey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Drake. Thank you, Mr. Drake. I, and I think we all appreciate all the work. I think you've been working on this 20 hours a day and we do <laughs> appreciate that. And I, I just wanna go back to some basic things and one you said earlier is in your presentation is that we had asked you as a board to look at new math materials a few years ago which you did and bridges and illustrative math I think we all agree we're really happy <coughs> um, with those programs I personally had no idea that came along with changing the course of how kids go through the system I mean when it was first mentioned a couple weeks ago or when I first heard about we were doing away with the enhanced math that was new to me so I've been trying to understand the reasons why um, but I do think and I appreciate all the teachers that were involved in this curriculum curriculum committee to come up with this um, program but I think they're looking out for what is best for the kids but I personally think that is what is best for kids is when the community and the district are working together. Mm -hmm. And I think the community, as you can see here, there's a lot of people I'm sure who are gonna be talking to this, um, maybe should have been involved a little earlier on, on these types of decisions. And I, <laughs> and I personally think that I would pray if my kids were still in school, I would probably be here sitting in this audience. Um, and I personally think that there are kids. I love the fact that it's, it's, it's deeper, more rigor. 
Um, we want coherence, we want an application. I appreciate that. I do believe there are kids that can get, delve into issues deeper, more quickly than others. I think it's just a fact. It's like, you know, I, I have three kids, but I'll just say two. One walked at nine months, one didn't walk till 13 months. It's just a difference in when people progress. It's not that any, either of them walk better than the other now. They just, you know, everybody ends up walking. But they, but they, maybe they do. <laughs> maybe. Um, Don't but, they, but, <laughs> but they progress at different levels. So I do have concerns about this, and especially, you know, we talk about our STEM kids. One of the things I've been most proud of lately that we've done is all the opportunities we've offered for kids in math and sciences, because if you look at, we, we went, many of us went uh, to the Chamber of Commerce dinners where they recognized the top academic students this year. And I'd, I'd say for the last several years, more and more, I would say 98% of those kids, when they get up and say where they're going to college and what they plan on majoring in, it has to do math or science, some, some STEM program. That's something I'm really proud of, not that they did it because of me, but we offered them the opportunities mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And I feel like this is kind of taking a step back in, the, in that area. Then one more thing, because I know other people have comments. Um, I think if we're trying to not accelerate in seventh and eighth, and then we don't even know what we're doing in high school. But to me, when you look at trying to accelerate starting in 10th grade, when kids are getting more and more into AP courses, it's more difficult to start that at that level than having them start earlier where they're, where they're already a little bit ahead. That's, that's so, um, I could say more, but I know more people. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No. no, keep talking. No, <laughs> Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I did have a question. Mm -hmm. I know the sixth grade students did end up being tested. Is that testing going to be used for anything? It can be, yes. That, that test is procedurally based, so it gives us information in relation to how kids can compute um, and at what levels they can compute. It doesn't give us much in relation um, to what they know conceptually about the math that they just computed. Um, so we would potentially look at some of the other measures that we have, mm -hmm. like the performance mm -hmm. task and things like that, to, to gather that evidence. Can you give them another test? Excuse me, you uh, are, excuse me, you're out of order. You can put in a card and speak. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, Mrs. Floor. Um, going along those lines, um, how did, I think I know the answer, but just just clarify um, for me, and then I'll I ask my question. So, currently, how did students get placed into yeah. the enhanced math seven and eighth in the la over the last four years? Um, I, I so one big component of that is the tests that they take, the the placement tests that they take in okay. sixth grade. Uh, they have to score a three or four on, which equates to I think a three is an eighty to an eighty nine, and a four is a ninety to one hundred. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's a procedurally based assessment. And then I'm sure that there's, um, you know, some uh, previous um, achievement that's considered by sites, and I would imagine they also look at test scores, but, but I know that the, the placement uh, test is a big portion of that. Um, and then my understanding is parents were also allowed to uh, select their students into the math 7th and 8th? I, those would be conversations that they would have had with principals. Okay, so uh, what you're what you're now what you're indicating now is um, students that are currently in the seventh eighth class they had to take a te they had to take a test now to pass in no in se seventh and eighth grade in order to move in the current seventh and eighth graders who are in the enhanced math are moving into math, math, math one, one and they had to take a test currently also. No, they completed, successfully completed that accelerated class. And if, how did they measure whether it was successfully completed? They had to demonstrate all, uh, all just procedural, or did they have to also um, teach a recommendation? Did they have to pass I a test? I would imagine grades um, uh, in, in the 7-8 class was the initial indicator. 
Um, you know, as I, as I said, I think we have a lot of work to do instructionally to make sure that our, that our courses are rigorous. So I, I can't speak to whether or not um, they, they were completely balanced in relation to concept, procedure, fluency, and application. Okay. Um, but I will say that our materials that we've adopted are balanced. So a student potentially, A, could be in the enhanced or math one. Let's, yeah. Next year, they could be in math one, um, having the computational portion of it, the procedural methods, but really not have a full grasp of the other programs. And, and so will, that, will there be an assessment to see whether they're actually placed correctly? Or, and we'll be offering them additional intervention if, if they need it, because they don't, they're still lacking some of the procedural, the, the what are the other what, what are the other ones? The conceptual and the application portion. Uh, um, those are all uh, places we can we can consider things we can consider. I mean, we could consider putting together you know that type of assessment now for sixth graders to take you know at, at different times this this summer if that's what we wanted to do. Okay. Um, so we could. I mean, those are all options for us. So so I guess the the two things that that uh, I think is really important given given. Um, and Mrs. Yeltsin and I were both at the meeting on, on Monday, is one is being able to communicate to the parents as soon as possible uh, where their student is placed um, based on whatever criteria in the cut scores, as I think you s indicated, for the incoming, sev incoming seventh graders, um, and whether that needs to have additional um, assessments or a combination of assessments, I'm sure that the parents here are willing to, to do whatever it takes to, to, us, to make sure that their student has, um, is appropriately placed, whether it's in a math seven, a math plus, or even math uh, procedurally you know, or intervention program. Um, so that could occur during the summer, are you? I mean, how do you plan we, we on would communicating have to that? We the test, but, okay. but I know that there are districts who have done that that we could, um, you know, work with. Okay. Uh, and then we would have to find some dates and times, probably multiple dates and times, to make sure people had a, a ample opportunity to do that. Okay. So uh, again, um, knowing our teachers, and I have uh, I have full faith and confidence in the majority of our teachers in the in in the in the seventh and eighth grade and beyond in terms of, especially in terms of math. Um, it's my understanding that even with teachers, it's a kid is placed in the wrong, say he's placed in math seven um, and should be in, do teachers have the leeway to, to move, move kids up or, or would, would they have the ability to do that or move kids down if yeah. they're just not being successful in wherever their placement is? I, I would say uh, teachers have uh, the leeway to start that conversation with counselors and uh, administrators uh, you know, to make that decision and families to make that decision collaboratively. Um, to say that they would just say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to put you in this class now. I think there's there's some conversation that we need to be had, but absolutely that starts from the teacher. Okay, great, thank you. Mrs. Montoya. I know that the kids took a test in procedural. That's what the sixth grade test has been. And while the new programs put more rigor, the rigor is in the conceptual and the application, if a child demonstrates that they've nailed those procedures, that makes the comprehension so much easier. It's sort of like, if you know your letter sounds, it makes reading the words and understanding what the words mean a whole lot better. If your fluency is slow, you can't, you, you struggle with the fluency and not with what they're really trying to say. So having a really good mastery of procedure is not a bad indicator of math placement. So I would hate to think that that is thrown out because you need that to to advance and I'm speaking from personal experience rather than my children because my children would rather die than have to be in all the math that I took um, but I was accelerated but I didn't realize it it's just I was put into this class when I got out of sixth grade and off I went and for me personally when I got became a senior in high school and I could take AP classes, I sat down and figured out, wait, if I wait another year, I can take this in college, it'll count as college and I don't have to do it again. That was my choice though. So 
I guess what I was looking at, and sadly while I was doing it, I think at the same time and answer my own questions, but to me, if we can compress a 10th grade class of taking math two for one semester and then math three for the other semester, that if we moved it to seventh grade, and they, but what my answer was, Great, it's good for the schools that have eight, period, eight periods a day because they could do math seven in one semester with a double block period and math eight. And if a kid loves math that much, I'd be fine taking two periods, taking math every day and moving faster. But we would have to come up with a way for the schools that only have a six period, the middle schools with only six periods to, to accommodate that. But from the stress that's on a kid by the time they get to high school in 10th and 11th grade, the thought of having to take one more AP class on top of another one, it, I guess what I'm saying is, gosh, there should be some way that we can make sure that the kids could double up in seventh grade and do it then, so that then they can move forward. So let's leave our noses and make it happen. I know it's not that easy. Yeah. But I wouldn't, I, but also from learning it all, you can't let it go. You can't miss math seven and say, well, you know what, they're so good they can miss seven and go to eight, because we found that. We've done that in years past. And then a child has this huge gap somewhere along the line that they're playing pickup with when math is really hard and moving really fast. So I don't like that either. And my other thing that I wanted to say was, I know that our math teachers are really strong in their math skills. <laughs> but I'm not sure how much training our secondary math teachers have had in differentiating within a classroom. And <laughs> that's, that's where I would want the emphasis to be. I know a lot of the math teachers on the steering committee, they're, they're the stars. They could do that without blinking. And, and it's not that they can't. It's just that we'd have to make sure that, that our secondary math teachers know what it looks like to differentiate in a secondary classroom. Elementary school teachers do it day in and day out. So those are my concerns. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think that that would be a concern that basically all stakeholders have expressed. Mm -hmm. um, there is, including our teachers, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll be, they were, mm -hmm. they were frank and say, mm -hmm. we're gonna need some help mm -hmm. in, in figuring this out. Um, once again, while a book can't do it, I can mm -hmm. tell you these materials support it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, along with training that we're committed to doing um, is there. The other perspective I would say in, um, you know, when, when we talk about compression, we don't talk about doing seventh and eighth grade English in one year. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about doing, you know, two, two different sciences. Uh, earlier on in one year. So it's it's really a matter of, from this group's perspective, when I say this group, the, the steering mm -hmm. committee, that from their experience receiving kids in high school, and this is what you hear from the Brandon Clays um, and the Emmy Samirs and these, these teachers, they don't have the depth of knowledge to build on um, because we have skipped some of these critical learnings in seventh and eighth grade. <laughs> Um, and their perspective, and it's a steering committee's, the, the one thing they are absolutely committed to is making sure that acceleration happens later on mm -hmm. when that foundation is there. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, I mean, there's arguments both ways to mm -hmm. it, but, but, but I will tell you um, from the teacher's perspective as well, they recognize they need support mm -hmm. um, in differentiation. That's gonna take a long time um, mm -hmm. and a lot of effort because um, it doesn't it doesn't happen you know overnight. There's not a training that they can go to and all of a sudden become um, you know differentiation experts. And then I'm going to say something. Sure. On that note, <clears throat> if a child is moving fast and this is like if a kid's going to be moving really fast, you've got that engineer, that future doctor that's sitting in that class. I would want to make sure my kid was in the class with the teacher that already knew how to do that. Then. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for us to say. And that's speaking as a parent, not as a teacher. Um, I, I really think um, with uh, COVID Core, the new standards, it's, it's changed the whole ball game. I appreciate what you did when you were in high school, but it's, it's a different <laughs> ball game out mm -hmm. there. And um, one of the reasons they were created by 
businessmen and colleges, um, their input was <coughs> valuable in creating these standards is that our children weren't prepared for high school. And um, we all make our decisions and, and go through it based on our experiences, based on uh, the trust we have in the teachers, based on research. I've listened to, we've listened to hours of this, mm -hmm. and uh, it's my opinion that we are doing a disservice to many of our students. We're not preparing them for college. And my personal experience is having mm -hmm. a student who was a valedictorian and got accepted in several engineering programs, USC engineering program. She could, she knew all the formulas, she knew how to mm -hmm. do math, but she didn't understand math. And it was really not helpful. And um, so I am really buying into this, um, what the, the, the teachers and the experts are saying, that we have to prepare our students for the basics, that we're not doing a good enough job in preparing them for the basics. And, uh, but I do appreciate that this is a new, these are new um, materials. Teachers haven't worked with them before. Some piloted them. Searching. Oh, it was your phone, so I just shut it. Um, <laughs> um, teachers haven't have piloted them, but they haven't worked with them before. So it, I think your um, your suggestion, their suggestion, to give it another year to to really get up on, on um, how to teach this, how to work with these materials, how to differentiate, how for us to bring in supports school, for them. High school will be able to I monitor. think once they get to high school, if you, they have those basics, they, it won't be as hard. I think the reason it is so hard is they don't have those basics. Um, Mrs. Yelsey. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see Mrs. Floor. You're first. Let her go first. Okay, Mrs. Floor. Oh. Um, no, I guess um, I'm at a quandary and I agree with Mrs. Mrs. Snell on this. I think part of uh, what concerns me the most, though, is the social-emotional um, aspects of, mm -hmm. of the pressure. We've had um, several conversations with Project success, uh, Challenge Success over the even course selections and and the requirements that we are placing on students, especially at the high, at the high school level, and the pressure and that um, their their belief that a each child at that, at that level developmentally they need at least nine hours of of sleep a night. Uh, they they like to see at least an hour a day of family time where a child or a student has an opportunity to spend and connect with their family. And then they talk about an hour a day of doing nothing, of sitting back and reading a good book and not, or, or just, just being, taking a walk. And then when you compress that, that's, that's 11 hours. And then they talk about adding the AP and how much homework is required. Then you, talk, you keep adding, and there doesn't seem to be enough time in a day for, uh, for students to get their, you know, and so there's a tremendous amount of pressure. And, and I think that that's something that we really seriously have to weigh in terms of acceleration. Yes, there are kids out there that can handle it. Absolutely, there's, there's no questions. It's like walking. Kids can walk at nine months, um, and kids take 13 months to walk. Um, and that's all at their own pace. But at the same time, I don't think you were actually pressuring your child at nine months to walk at nine months. It was like, hello, they just got up and walked. Um, you might be pressuring them at 11 months or 13 months to get out of you. Know. Um, so I, I think that that's something that we really have to consider is, is taking some, some of the pressure, pressure off to, to be successful. Um, we we look at our students and we want the best for every single student and every single and you know uh, colleges are looking at changing and how how they're accepting students we want well-rounded students and and part of the part of my concern in terms of even in the in the scenarios is is that yes we have two schools that have the opportunity because they're on block scheduling they have two schools that they they could double up um, because they can go every day but at what expense that means that they have electives. Well, now 
if they're really so inclined, terrific. But at what expense? Not being able to take art, not being able to participate in um, dance, uh, band, um, science, maybe they want to, you know, maybe there's other interests. So I, I just really concerned about accelerating at the seventh and eighth grade. Th that's an opportunity for kids to explore um, all their passions. Uh, with college and career, we're looking at going down below um, in terms of pathways and ROP courses, and we look at Naviance of, of helping kids identify risk, sort of risk free of where what their passions are, and if we can press and say, well, you, now you have to take double, double math because we're offering that because that's the only way we can do it so that they can accelerate, at what expense? At what expense of childhood? Um, and, I, and I agree that there are kids that can do it. I agree that there are kids that are, that are doing it, but how many Stephen Hawkings are there um, in our school district? How many, you know, there may be tons of them, but I, I don't know, but I don't wanna, at the expense of, of them doing great things, but the expense of a childhood. So um, I like the fact that you are providing an option for kids, that you are providing um, those students who really are focused on math, at a very early age, you have you have that option of doing offering the nine plus, you know, the seven plus. But at the same time, it is it is the seventh grade curriculum, but more focused, um, more rig not rigorous, but a deeper, deeper, deeper yes. understanding, and that they can communicate. I think that it's being able to to do math problems. I mean, I remember, I still remember my chemistry and my my you know how to do some of the okay. equations. But no. ask me how to explain it. There is no way I could explain that. That's that's why you do it that way. I just know what the Pythagorean theorem is. I just know how to do it. I, I know it. So, anyway, Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, I. You know, I want to go back to this. Um, I think we all agree kids develop differently in every way, <laughs> academically, emotionally, and I know we are very concerned about the emotional component of it. And I guess. I probably know, because I'm in that area, Corona Del Mar, I know those schools the best. And I've been around at all five elementary schools quite a bit. And I would venture that at, at each of those schools, if you talk to the principal, there's probably at least five kids who they would feel are emotionally and academically prepared mm -hmm. for a higher level. So that's, you know, that's 25 that's kids class. right there. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is broad scaled offer, but I think that if kids test, if they are whatever um, criteria we're gonna determine this on, I don't think it's just, it should just be a parent says, oh yeah, I want my kid to be in advance. I think there has to be some um, testing component to it. Um, I still don't see why for that small group, we don't give them a chance to, in, move at an accelerated uh, rate and still dig deeper. I just don't get it. And, and because <laughs> I'm trying not to do the how, I'm just, I'm, I'm really trying not to, but I just came up with an idea. Um, because Mesa also is 712. Mesa also could do the, I'm sorry, could do the, doing it together in middle school. And the schools that aren't, if you're talking about five kids or four kids at different schools, if they're not at that school, there are two schools, one on each side of the bay, mm -hmm. that if this is what you wanted for your, if this is what mm -hmm. your child wanted, the teachers all agreed, everybody agreed, mm -hmm. that little Billy is gonna be our next brilliant person, then they could be, that would be, you know, mm -hmm. I need to go to that school because they'll be offering that mm -hmm. in, in a, Mush mm -hmm. in the, not in compressed, but in speed. It's accelerated. It's not it cutting It can be it accelerated short. and deeper, though. Oh, I well, the whole program is deeper, so of course it's going to be deeper, and if you're doing it every day for an hour and a half so, a day, you have plenty of time to go deep, just and not program. necessarily, you're not covering the, air, the material faster as faster, meaning like you're not skipping stuff to get it done quicker. You're doing twice as much to get it done quicker. But if you love math, that's okay with you. And you still have two other electives to take. So you don't have to give up. You have to give up something. Electives make you give up something. 
Yeah. How many because otherwise, total? we'd have kids in school from seven till nine, <coughs> taking all sorts of fun stuff. So I, I they're I looking just, at changing uh, changing attendance. I know they're doing, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that was just one. Uh, Sounds like, good. We're so smart. We've got to be able to make this happen without giving it up. Because I don't think you should give up the content of seventh and eighth grade. Okay. Don't don't dilute it. Move it along faster. Okay, Madam President. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to add a separate context to this. Okay. Uh, none of us that, the, that are sitting up here at the dais uh, uh, have been involved in the conversations for the last 18 months no, we with these teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, speaking to you five, six years ago about uh, trying to take the fear away and having everybody get their handprints on big decisions that are going on. Uh, and you made this, and you reminded me of that uh, when uh, you asked us to look at uh, math materials for elementary. Um, so, you know, I gave the charge to the team, and uh, they've been recognized for this incredible adoption process now nationally. I think Mr. Drake is making a doing a tour <laughs> on speaking about the the adoption process that we're using. Um, but what we really, really did, okay, is we trusted our teacher leaders to lead the process. Mm -hmm. And what we said is, okay, we're gonna listen to you when you make the recommendation, okay? I think that's really, really important. Uh, this is not a decision made by Sarah, by Tim Holcomb, by Fred Navarro, by Jeff. Um, I support our teachers. I have faith in them that they're doing the best for every child, um, and I think that's what this is really about. We gave them the uh, authority to make this decision, and we need to honor that authority. Mm -hmm. um, they've come to you, they've taken some feedback, they've addressed it in one way. If you want them to go back and look at it, that's fine. Uh, but I think we need to honor the fact that these have been the people that have been working for 18 months. My understanding of the process and why it became a, 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 a recommendation late in the school year is it through the process and preparing for the adoptions and learning about uh, the uh, standards, what the standards require, seeing what the success rates are for students who have a complete seven, uh, eight uh, math curriculum in ACTs and SATs, and those that don't, it's a stark difference as to how successful you are in some of those achievement tests. Um, and that's some of the information that the, the, that the committee reviewed. Uh, so, they spent 18 months looking at materials. This came about in May because that's when they finished their review. And then they came up and said, we really like to recommend how we're teaching, how we're organizing the instructional program in, in, our, pro, in our school district. So um, if you'd like to have the, the John take back your, these ideas, comments to the committee, we'll be happy to do that. Um, but we do have to rely on our experts, and those are our teachers mm -hmm. who are leading this, uh, this, this process. We have uh, 10 uh, TOSAs, okay? They all work part-time in the classroom, part-time uh, leading the district. We have 40 content area coaches at, e at our secondary schools, each of them in a se separate subject area. We really rely on their expertise. We really rely on their guidance. We really rely on their experience. I think they've done an incredible job um, our, our, I think our elementary K-5 staffs did an incredible job on their math adoption process. I believe the uh, middle school teachers have done the same. And what I'm most proud of is that how the uh, high school teachers are also contributing to this middle school decision. And they're a part of this conversation. So nothing's being done mm -hmm. in isolation. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm in isolation because I'm a consumer of this information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one thing I would ask is that uh, if you want them to consider other things, great, but I think what we need to do is rely on our, on our teachers to make the decision they believe is be in the best interest of our district. Thank you. Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, I just want to go back to one more time, though. I, I do appreciate everything the teachers have done, the steering committee, and I oh think I gosh, told them that, yes. we've all told them that. I appreciate that, but I want to go back to what I said before, that I think what's best for kids is when the community and district are working together. And the teachers don't, the, the teachers don't look at it at all from a community input. They are looking at it from what they think is best for kids. They're, and I think there has, 
I mean, that's their job. They don't go out and talk to people in the community. Um, they may talk to a parent here or there, but really in terms of making these decisions, they were looking at it what they thought was best for the, the community, and I think that's honestly how they feel. But I do think we, look, we have to look at it more broadly. Mrs. Floor. So would you just put back up the, uh, what, 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 after. What do, you, what do you want? The rec, okay, so as Dr. Navarro, so they came up with one proposal. Now you've met how many, you said you met six hours additionally as recent about, as? Yeah. We and met who was, three and a half who, hours. And yesterday. who was on there? Because I know that we're on break uh, now, the, so. <coughs> three of the four um, middle school principals. Who were? Uh, which, which principals uh, were there? DePauly, uh, Becky Gogol. Um, and Jake um, Haley was there okay. representing Costa Mesa. Okay. And then uh, Brandon Clay. Um, Is the AP Calculus? AP Calc. Nathan Hunter from Estancia. Uh, I'm blanking on all the other names. Oh, no, there were eight really. teachers there. Uh, three from Costa Mesa, two from Corona Del Mar. Okay. Um, Newport Harbor and Ensign. So okay, there, so, there, there was and, representation. And that was this last week, right? That yesterday, yesterday was the yesterday. The and so about three and a half, four So hours. the recommendation is could you put it back up on the board again? The recommendation is so Do you want to see the chart? Offering uh, offering basically a, a math seven plus for kids <laughs> who qualify, um, which would allow us to take those kids and go to, to deeper levels of understanding of math seven content. Okay, and so would there be an eighth grade math plus two? We would want to see how this worked in 1819. So this is their commitment this is to 1819. So this is only for next for, for next Correct. year. So seventh grade would be seven math seven or math seven plus, and that they would be used multiple measures for cut points. So we already know that they've taken the sixth grade test, they've done a performance sort of base, and so you'd be coming up with some additional criteria. We can. And then yes. you'd be giving that to you'd let a, you'd let the do we have to adopt that? Well, I don't think we do well, wait. Before. Math the kids that took um, enhanced math seven eight would have math one. Right. Yes, they're having they're having yes. math one. Yes. But the incoming the incoming seventh graders. Right. So they're going to take math seven or math seven, seven plus. plus. Correct. Okay, and the, and you're going to place those through multiple measures. Um, with cut points and you're going to communicate that yes. with the parents if there's additional testing that needs to be required you'd be you'd be working that out with that and then you're going to continue to su do the intervention so like my kid for example like my kid my kid said i don't want to do the enhanced math because I want to, I don't want to work that hard. Uh -huh. I want to enjoy seventh grade, so I'm not going to take the seventh. I'm not going to do the enhanced math. I'm going to do regular math, so I can get an A and I can have fun at school. So um, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's what that's what she basically you know she didn't want to work that hard. So um, so there will still be within the regular math class based on the the illustrative math program. There is that challenge portion. So uh, the kids are going to still be challenged. And the math plus are going to be deeper, deeper. It's going to be a lot of it. Yes. In the math. With mathematical argumentation and all of those. So that's the argument. Oh, that's a new one. Okay. And then math seven, regular seven, they're going to, the regular seventh, they will have the, also have the, they'll have portions of enhanced seventh math too because they can go deep. They can deep through that challenge. Yeah, I mean, part. the materials lend themselves to taking kids as deep as they can go. Okay. Um, and so they also lend themselves to making sure that all kids can access the, their grade level content. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's, okay. we can take kids as deep as, as, as the materials will let us, which is, is, okay. is you know. Okay. So then eighth graders, current eighth graders, no, current yeah. seventh graders will either go into math eight or into math one. Correct. Right? Okay. And then, uh. Yes. Students that took math one in eighth grade are now ninth graders. They will take math two. Yes. So as, they will they, they will continue that they will continue on the progression that was started in their their career. So if they yes. took math math one as an eighth grader, they will be in math two 
and move forward. Yes. Any other, the current eighth, the other promoting not eighth graders will go into math one, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. And that's uh, currently. Mrs. Floor, okay, can I interrupt you yeah, for a minute? That's perfect. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Dr. Navarro has a suggestion. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think what uh, we have a lot of parents here, and that's great. What we'd like to offer then, rather than to settle on this tonight, you have you see that the teachers did take into consideration what they heard at the mm -hmm. me meeting, meeting on Monday night. Uh, so I would like to ask Mr. Drake to organize and we'll recruit our math teach our teachers to come and we'll pay them. But we would like to, uh, I think we should offer a uh, another math forum in each zone this summer to collect more information directly from our parents so our teachers can hear it. Because uh, they're not here tonight. Um, right. And uh, what I would like to do is just say, okay, well, do you have, we have an idea, but let's go and take some more comment and, and move forward. Right now, the plan is your seventh and eighth grade, or seventh grade, it took seven, eight, are going to be in math one next year anyway, so right. they're not being affected. Mm -hmm. So we could focus our, conf, our, 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 our meetings or our uh, forums on seventh grade math. Uh, and perhaps after hearing more from the community, mm -hmm. we the, we'll ask our math teachers to consider, consider the comments and then come back to us uh, uh, and provide you with the recommendations, probably uh, in writing over the summer mm -hmm. when we're on break, but mm -hmm. uh, definitely to give you an update on where we're going. Um, I think it, nothing, there's nothing wrong with going out into the community and taking mm -hmm. more feedback. And since it, oops, may I? Since it's summer, could parents be confident that if they sent emails or sent documentation and that it would be read out loud at that meeting or had that No, we would just give that information to the to, to this committee to read on its own. But they but they would get it. Yeah, they would is, get it. Is, because it's a it's a tough time. This is the LC. Well, I just wondered if there's a I mean, could we do this over the course of the year and continue with what we have for, next, for this coming year? Well, I would like to have that uh, considered by the committee and come back to you with what their recommendation is after listening to all this. Okay. Um, we have, um, I am going to call a break, but before I do that, um, we have um, how many, 30, 33 um, uh, speakers that want to speak on math, and we have another 15 people that just want to speak on okay. things. And so, um, usually we allow 20 minutes per subject. Now, I know there are a lot of you here and you came, so I'm gonna give you some options and you could t talk about it over the break. It's just gonna be a five minute break. Um, we can either, um, everybody gets two minutes so that everybody can speak and it takes an hour, or um, you can decide that you don't need to speak and, and somebody else if we come up with um, an uh, amount of speakers that fills an hour with three minutes, we can do it that way. Okay. If, if they don't speak, can they uh, submit their comments into the record? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Or they can email them when they get home. I don't know if they have them with them that they want to submit. So. so I, you know, I know a lot of you probably know each other and know, um, so let me see, an hour back. would be like, um, somebody quick, do the math, math. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, 20, uh, 22 students, 25 students, now that's 60, okay, you can figure it. Okay, here, here's the, here's the, okay, I don't want to have a conversation with you, okay, because I'm not really supposed to. How about I call a break and we'll have a conversation? How's okay. that? Okay, we're breaking for five minutes.
you take your seat? Keep going. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> we, okay, we have an hour to speak on math, so we need to on. get it's going. Not, it's not on. Oh. Okay, now it is. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know why it's not carrying. Hey. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we have some seats up in front if someone uh, wants to sit. There are seats up in front if uh, the front row, if someone wants to sit seats. down there. Up there. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to call. Um, I'm going to call uh, three names so that you, and that way you can come right up and, and we'll move right along. Everybody's going to get two minutes. And, um, you want me to read the co community input? Part? Oh, yes, please do. <laughs> that takes five minutes. Okay. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. But Go it's, ahead. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to address the board on consent calendar agenda items or on non agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board per. Um, per board policy 9323, each speaker um, tonight will have two minutes to cover one or multiple topics, and speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers. And there is a maximum of tonight will be 60, 60 minutes. Is that what you said? 66? 60 minutes just on math. Just on math. Yeah. Um, uh, per topic, um, with board consent, the board the board president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. Um, any board member or member of the public may request that a matter within the jurisdiction of the board be placed on the agenda of a regular meeting by submission of board policy uh, bylaw 9322 agenda request form to the superintendent. When a request is made during a public meeting, all verbal requests must be followed up with the submission of board board bylaw 9322 agenda request form to the superintendent. When addressing the board, it is uh, helpful if you state your name and address for the record. Okay, our first speaker, our first three speakers are Aaron Crane, Catherine Apish, and um, Christy Marr. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So we'll start with um, Aaron. Good evening. Thank you for your mm -hmm. time. Um, I'm Aaron Crane. I live at 209 Marguerite. I have one at Harborview, one at CDM, who just finished Enhanced Math 8. Mm -hmm. He did an awesome job, but it was not uh, without a lot of coaxing from my husband and I to, you can do this, you can do this. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I'm really glad to see that there is some plan in place for those kids. Mm -hmm. But my question is, and I know the, that there has been a committee working on this for it seems like 18 months now, but mm -hmm. as a parent community, to us this feels like a rush. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna know why now on the brink of summer, why are we rushing to implement this <coughs> you know, new path? Okay, Thanks. thank you. Uh, Catherine Peach. I, maybe I'm mispronouncing it. P.I. Oh, here she comes. Nope, that's not her. Let me see. Oh, are you Kath? Okay, well, why don't you come on up? Hi, my name is Christy Marr, and I live at 2238 Park Carlisle. And my oldest daughter just completed uh, advanced math at CDM, where I was scared to let her do it. She really wanted to do it, and she had, was very successful. And... I never predicted that she would be so motivated and excited by math, but it was being with a group of kids mm -hmm. at the same level mm -hmm. that motivated her and it made math fun. And it wasn't boring, it was exciting. And, it, and um, I'm hoping my second daughter who's at Anderson will have the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I question also now on the new program, she would go into math one with ninth graders who might not have that same love of math, which mm -hmm. concerns me mm -hmm. as well. So I just would hope that you would um, consider grouping uh, the children by ability, mm -hmm. uh, especially in math, because mm -hmm. I think if your goal is really to the deep knowledge that you can't do that when you have such a variable mm -hmm. inability with 40 kids and one teacher. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. 
Okay. Um, okay. okay. Um, Mary Delahanty, Michelle. Oh, she left. Uh, Michelle Barto. Yes. And um, Dorothy Haas. Hi, Miss Barto. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Michelle Barto. I live at 2461 Crestview Drive in Newport Beach. Um, I am here, I'll be brief. Um, I echo what many of the board have said about accelerated math students. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pleased with what I've seen for the sixth through eighth math materials. And I totally agree that in many cases for most students, repetitive concepts is a great way for students to learn. However, with students who are accelerated, in many cases they have a intuitive understanding of math concepts, which is why that the procedures that are introduced to them um, help them to move so quickly. Um, studies will back this up, that tracking in eighth grade does lead to higher AP scores. And to quote the Brown Center for a uh, Report on American Education, just as a high school varsity athlete does not enter the court for the first time as a senior, a successful AP calculus student does not encounter advanced math for the first time in 12th grade. Um, high school students hold down jobs, play sports, and have schedules that are already overwhelmingly demanding. An approach that would require an even more demanding academic schedule would place an undue burden of stress on students who are trying to achieve what their uh, peers a few years older have already achieved. Please consider allowing students with a high interest in math and focus on math to continue to be able to take Math One in eighth grade. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Um, first of all, just to lighten things up, after 36 years of teaching high school mathematics, I promised myself I'd never come to another school board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am. My uh -huh. two granddaughters uh, go to school in Corona Del Mar. I actually live in Cyprus, uh -huh. 11340 Providencia Street. Mm -hmm. I have both a bachelor's and a master's degree in math, and I taught from the lowest of the low through BC calculus uh, for 36 years. Mm -hmm. And I know from my experience, without a doubt, and all the brain research backs me up, that to put all kids of the same age in the same level mathematics goes against, I, I, I would stake my life on it, it's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> I, I could give hundreds of examples from my experience where the ability to do um, symbolic reasoning, for example, or spatial and depth perception or logical reasoning just doesn't mature at the same rate in every brain. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say the kids that are slower to mature aren't bright. Mm -hmm. History is filled with uh, geniuses that were once considered slow. <laughs> And I just think it is the wrong thing to do to have the same math, all the same age kids in the same math mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there were a couple other things I wanted to say, but I, I, two days a week, this for the last two years, I volunteered at Harborview Elementary mm -hmm. School. I've taught algebra, geometry, probability and statistics, and history of math to a group of 16 sixth graders. Did it last year, two days a week. I drive all the way down and do it for an hour and a half every Tuesday and Thursday. These kids are soaking it up. I've taught them so much algebra that they could. I mean, that's my time. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ryan O'Grady and Gia Goltani. Good evening, Mr. O'Grady. Hello, uh, Ryan O'Grady, mm -hmm. 2655 Basswood in Newport mm -hmm. Beach. Uh, so I'll just try to be quick. Um, mm -hmm. The one of the premises in the in the report was that it just seemed like there was a premise that students only take math at school. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably a lot of people here have students who do extracurricular math. Mm -hmm. uh, my son's a sixth grader at CDM at, or at East Bluff, and he does <laughs> algebra at home for fun. He's been in Russian School of Mathematics for four years. Wow. So, I mean, this premise of, that he should atrophy in seventh and eighth grade and then catch up in 10th and 11th grade so that he can go to USC or UCLA where they got 127,000 applications, it just, 
It doesn't really make any sense. It definitely doesn't make sense for him. Um, the concept that it's not possible, it's done at Tustin Unified, Irvine Unified. It's done at Laguna Beach Unified. Three years ago, they were given the exact same plan mm -hmm. and implemented it, and then a year later, threw it out because, and put the seventh graders back in the accelerated math. Mm. Um, so I, I emailed you guys, I encourage you to mm -hmm. take a look at that. Um, the plan literally has the words TBD in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really much of a plan. And so the idea to sort of keep things the way they are and postpone them for a year and um, just to allow you know, more community input, I think is a really good idea. And I'll leave uh, with, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Chase Garbers. He's a star football quarterback for CDM. Mm. And uh, he started as a sophomore. And he started as a sophomore because the coach said, this kid's ready. So we don't have a head math coach. We're depending on you guys to make that decision for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very oh, much. I think it was my name meant to say. I'm Gia Gaffney. Yeah. And um, I, I actually know a teacher on the curriculum committee. And this has been very confusing to me tonight because this teacher loves the new curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I trust that teacher to love it. Mm -hmm. But she was flabbergasted and a bit horrified when she heard how it was going to be implemented. So I wish future discussions would in, would differentiate between the new illustrative math mm -hmm. and just eliminating the advanced placement option. Um, and I understand all the reasoning about learning core concepts before advancing, but I don't think what has been proposed is an appropriate solution. And I use the word appropriate because as we all know, our students are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. And for these kids that I know being told, you have to learn the same stuff that you've been learning since fourth grade. And truly, if you would let Mrs. Haas finish, she has been teaching these kids truly a mastery of these advanced subjects. And she has told me that 13 kids she would recommend go straight into eighth grade math. So I would ask that this proposal be delayed at least a year to work out what placement test should be given, how that would work, how to measure student learning outcomes, and to realize that math is incremental. It is not like English at all. And what I'm hearing here is that if you are an engineer, like my dad, he's a nuclear physicist, he tested out of several subjects. Should he then have to go back because he never got the rigor in those subjects when he's advising presidents of the United States on energy policy? I would say no, just like my kid, I'm not saying I have a genius or something, but he's been spending four hours a week extra every week on math. He's got it by now. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Peter Boyd and Sophie Courtney. Good evening, board. Our first responsibility is to provide a quality, ed quality educational program that meets the needs of all students in the district. That is the number one item on your belief statement. Mm -hmm. If fully 15% of the students presently are taking advanced math, that's inconsistent with your own belief statement. I'm not a math teacher, but that's close to one seventh of the students at the seventh and eighth grade level. <laughs> this currently proposed math realignment does not need, meet the needs of my child who's advanced in mathematics. At the meeting at Harbor High School, the math TOSA from Costa Mesa, who piloted, said that the advanced students helped the other students. You have employees in this district who do that. They're called teachers. <laughs> My daughter is not a pseudo employee, and it is not her responsibility to help students who do not have the same aptitude for math that she presently has. So I'm going to put this into a different context. Some other speakers have done the same thing. This would be if you're, like your wrestling program having one weight class, and every student would be wrestling against every other student, no matter their physical size. That's crazy. Now, this is where I may lose some of you, and some of you may get offended. That is not my intention. 
There has been a recent history in this district of math programs not going well. And to say that the teachers backed it, I find that very challenging to believe because six and seven and eight years ago, the elementary math program, teacher, teachers teaching the elementary math program voiced their concerns and all of you, when it came to a head, said, this is the first we've heard about it. This is coming from teachers saying, just like the previous speaker, there's a problem with this. So I'm not saying there's an intention to deceive, but I don't think you're getting all the information. So I would consider this a good chance for you to get on the right side of an issue and reconsider. Thank you. Sophie Courtney and Thomas Courtney. Um, hi, my name's Sophie. I'm 16. I live in CDM. I just finished my 11th grade year at the Orange County School of the Arts. I took calculus, um, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, when I went through middle school, the way it worked was you took a test and there was no enhanced math 7, 8. It was just that you skipped both math 7 and 8 and you went straight to math 1. Um, that's what I did in middle school and I found it to really um, kind of fit my needs as a student. My mom is really good at math mm -hmm. and she taught me a lot of math before going into middle school and I think that an accelerated program really allowed me to continue with that sort of um, interest in mathematics. I'd also like to say that there's been a lot of talk about children being interested in STEM and our future engineers wanting to take math class. Well, I want to be a lawyer <laughs> and I think that it's just as important to provide your, your future lawyers or even your mm -hmm. future singers or dancers mm -hmm. um, with the opportunity to take classes that challenge them and classes that interest them um, and not at the expense of another block. Um, I'd also like to talk about a middle school science program that we have at my school. <coughs> it's called Science Academy. It teaches the normal seventh or eighth grade science curriculum in about 60% of the time that it's normally taught in and the rest of the time is reserved for a program called Science Olympiad, which is a competitive mm -hmm. science program. Mm -hmm. uh, this program has been implemented to great success and there were a couple points earlier about how uh, because this sort of thing isn't done with English, it isn't done with science, we shouldn't do it with math either. Um, it is done with science and in some schools that I'd really love to go to, it is done with English. And I think that if we have the opportunity to do it with math, we should seize that opportunity and allow students to challenge themselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Thomas Courtney. Hello. Uh, my name is Thomas Courtney. I live at 1245 Surfline Way in Corona mm -hmm. Del Mar. And it seems like there are two issues that are coming to me. One is uh, acceleration, and the other one is what's good for everybody, what's the best we can be. And mm -hmm. I think with regard to acceleration, I think of it like a, a runner or a swimmer might, where you know, if somebody's really fast, you don't want to hold them back and, and make them run you know, at a 10 minute mile pace if they can run at a five minute mile pace, and, and then maybe they can get to four minutes if they keep going. But if they train at 10 minutes, they'll never get to four minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, with regard to what's good for everybody, um, I wonder, have you all looked at the U.S. Department of Education website, which has statistics on the performance of schools? And are, is, maybe it could be an agenda item to go over that at a future meeting, but my understanding is that our school district is in the bottom one-third with regard to performance for this, the socioeconomic level of, uh, of our community. And I would be interested if we could get the statistics to even look at it by school and see is it a couple schools that need more help or is it overall we're not doing best practices and maybe we need to look around and see what are other schools with high performing uh, you know, good results doing and try to do more of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Johnson and Vin Nguyen. 
So, so it's a little bit like deja vu for me because I, I grew up in Oklahoma and um, I actually grew up below the poverty line. My mom cleaned houses and she thought education was really, really important. And, and I was really good at math. Mm -hmm. And so my mom fought with the school to get me to be able to take advanced math and they told her, no, we don't do that. And she fought and fought and eventually went all the way to the school board and I finally got to take advanced math starting in middle school and then you know I finished all the math and started taking some college classes, but that put me on a, on a, on a trajectory to get into you know, the school that I wanted to get to, to get an internship at NASA, and then to get a job at PIMCO, and, and now I'm a managing director and a partner there. And, and that was all started because my mom challenged the, the conventional thing that everybody has to be in the same group. And so that worked really well for me, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would just encourage you to kind of consider that. That's anecdotal, but I think the other thing that's been, that's been talked about is this idea that that there is a lot of research that goes into to educational practices. And, and I think Dr. Navarro made a comment that some of that had been looked at in these cases. And, and I'd like to be open-minded about this issue. So if there were studies that had been done, if there were data, I'd be open-minded to hearing kind of how that informed that. And maybe this is the right practice, but, I, but, I, but I'd like to see that data. And I think that could, that could persuade others and, and inform them. Um, so, so I, would, I would encourage everyone to do that. And then also just on the plan, you know, I find it amazing that we're talking about we can't compress into seventh and eighth, but, but that we can later. I mean, the plan accelerates, it decelerates, it accelerates again. I mean, <laughs> I mean a, steady, a steady path. I mean, if, if you're climbing a mountain, you, 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 you pace yourself. And the same is true of, of this curriculum. And so I would, I would just say that a, that a measured approach is right. If, if you go fast and slow and fast again, and that's not going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Long. Tony Long? Oh, no, wait. I, I skipped somebody. Then Nguyen. Then, then Nguyen. Then Nguyen. Sorry. I apologize. There you go. My name is Vian Nguyen. I live at 1245 Surf Line Way in Coron del Mar. I myself am a mathematician. I have mm -hmm. a bachelor's and a PhD in math. I've mm -hmm. taught math at the graduate level. So I really loved what Mr. Driggs said about rigor, depth, and conceptual understanding when it comes to math. Um, I have four children. Uh, the oldest just graduated from high school, and the youngest is in fourth grade at Harborview. So my concern is not about the new curriculum in general. My great concern is the elimination of the math acceleration option. Um, I have three older children who've gone through the accelerated program. Um, they've all done very well. And math has always been one of their favorite classes in school, in no small part because it was a challenging class for them. Um, they, they liked the pace and the depth at which the classes were taught, which was more fitting <laughs> to their learning style. And um, I think just as, as important, they were sitting with peers who were equally capable of understanding math um, with the same level of rigor and conceptual understanding. Um, they did not suffer from being accelerated in math. I think they thrived quite a bit. So uh, I understand that the committee has teachers and principals and staff members who've been studying this for, what, close to two years. And um, I very much appreciate that, that care um, with the study of the curriculum. And I have a couple of questions I would like to ask of the committee. So the questions are specific to this cohort of students who've been accelerated. Um, what does the data show? What does the data show for the progress of this cohort of students as they went through high school? Were they helped or hindered by being accelerated? Uh, second, for the students that have been accelerated and for the changes that are being proposed, what are the expected changes and improvements in their performance? So okay. I'd like to see the data. Thank you. And we will pass that on. <laughs> Tony Long and Robert Parzik is next. Hi, Tony Long, 121 Jasmine Creek, Corona Del Mar. Um, I have a, a kid who just finished the grade seven advanced math. He did great in it. He liked it. Um, it was the only um, advanced class available to him at CDM, um, despite being a Gates student in his um, K through six school. Um, and I have a, a younger kid who I hope will place into advanced math. 
Um, I'm also a professor at UCI in School of Biological Sciences. I teach um, genetics, the genetics of complex traits, statistical genetics, um, computational genetics. So I know a little bit about STEM. And our, <laughs> our students are, are really unprepared when they hit college um, in math and STEM. Um, there's a fear amongst college professors that like China's going to own the rest of the century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have to do better. Um, I think we're, we, the way to do that is to challenge the kids. We have to challenge them more. We're not challenging them when we put them in a class not with their academic peers. Um, I think we have to get them in groups that, that top 15% and keep them in that top 15%. Um, the other thing we're doing at university now and all the cool people are doing is quants, right? That's what we're doing in Silicon Valley. Let's look at the numbers. I mean, we have cohorts of kids that have come through the advanced um, math and kids that haven't. We can look at their grades in the upper courses um, and look at how we're doing. Now, you can always say, well, the tests don't measure their true understanding of the topic. Well, you know, again, in STEM, all that matters is what we can quantify. That's what STEM is about. That's the underlying basis of statistical, you know, genetics and everything else. So we, we just have to go with the numbers we have. Um, it's also a lot of people peak in math early. It's one subject where people do peak early. I'm going to just finish with um, Newton published the principles before he was 30. Um, after he turned 30, he largely wrote about religious philosophy and that. Mathematicians burn out early. You've got to start them early. <laughs> Good evening, board. I'm Bob Parzik. I live at 2612 Wavecrest Drive. I have a son who's going into CDM in seventh grade next year and a son in Harborview going into fifth grade next year. And I strongly urge you not to eliminate the accelerated math. Um, in the current proposal, it contemplates uh, that there will be intervention support classes for the bottom cohort of students. Wouldn't it be fair and equitable that there be intervention support classes for the top cohort? Let's not eliminate opportunities for our students. This would happen because they would have to take two math courses, I understand it, and thereby be conflicted to take other electives mm -hmm. in their sophomore year to jump ahead. Um, also, various courses require higher math as a prerequisite. Let's not limit their options. There can be a focus on depth and rigor for all students, but do so at a different cadence for those who are more capable. If not two years in one, how about one and a half years in one, or one and a quarter years in one? There's not whole numbers that we have to abide by here. I have a few questions. How can a new math program be designed and proposed for middle school without proposed pathways for high school? Seems odd to me. <laughs> Shouldn't we wait one year for a holistic approach and further feedback to get it right rather than get it rushed? I would like to hear also, as somebody else brought up, what are the lessons that have been learned by Laguna Beach's failed attempt to a homogeneous math instruction? Finally, I understand part of the protocol here is to potentially request a study session to interactively and transparently address these issues. I would like to request one because as much as I'd like to see a progress made over the summer, I want to talk to somebody about it. I don't want to learn about it after the fact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tim Kearney and Nikki Clue. Tim, uh, okay, he lives at uh, on Berkshire Lane. No, maybe he left. Uh, Nikki uh, Clue lives on Port Luxley Place. Did I say it wrong? Uh, well. <laughs> My name is Nikte Flores. I live on 531 San Bernardino Avenue. I have three children, one who's going into 10th grade, another who's going into 9th, and another who's going into 7th. My uh, soon-to-be 10th grader did um, accelerated math, a little bit of swan math, enhanced math 1 and 2 in 7th and 8th grade. I mean, I mean um, honors math in 7th, honors math in 8th, and then enhanced math 2 in 9th grade. S completely successful. So thank you to all the teachers and everything. It was a wonderful experience for him. My uh, middle child, unfortunately, had, I'm sorry, uh, the experience with swan math in uh, fourth and fifth grade. 
At that point, we were also digging deeper at that time. So this notion of digging deeper has been ingrained in our children since she was probably in second or third grade. So this is nothing new. Um, my soon to be seventh grader has already, she was part of the pilot program for illustrative math. She has done great, but she would like to do more. She's not, super, she's not challenged. They have a, a, an extra math problem a day to dig deeper, maybe two, but she still is not challenged. She's doing great on the tests. She's getting you know, 99s to 100% on everything. And she was looking forward to seventh grade honors math. And so you can imagine how disappointed she was along with myself. So I would strongly encourage like everyone else, let's learn the program first, learn it well for three, four years, and then decide if you wanna change the pathways. Reevaluate, let the teachers understand the program and then make different choices for the end result. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Carol Karnick and Amy Hikes. Hi, I am Nikki Klein. I live at 1939 Port Loxley Place. And I have a confession to make tonight. Uh -huh. I'm a math flunky. <laughs> That's okay. So imagine my great surprise when I had two children who were really, really adept at math. And I was thrilled because my daughter um, has, has loved it and just taken off with it. And, then, and she is a rising senior at CDM. And my son just finished seventh grade enhanced math at CDM as well. And um, I just wanna say that enhanced math is an amazing program. And it's created a pathway for him um, to take the advanced math classes that I know he's gonna wanna take. It's been his favorite class this year. And um, one of the most challenging and, and rigorous. And, um, and I really appreciate that the program is available for him. I hope it will be going forward for the others as well. Um, I did wanna say that we moved here two years ago from Atlanta and my kids were in Atlanta public school there. And my son was part of a pilot program as a fifth grader where they pulled out the top five, maybe 10% um, of the top math kids and they taught sixth grade math to the kids as fifth graders. And that was how they determined to um, get these kids on the advanced math track at an even earlier age than middle school. Because all the research that they had done showed that the sooner those kids could double up on math, the better it was for them. I can tell you as the mother of a daughter who just finished her junior year, you do not want to do it in high school. Mm -hmm. The sooner these kids can do it, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Hikes. I live at 1957 Port Bristol Circle. I have three kids in the district. I have one that's going to be going into eighth grade, one going into sixth grade, and one going into fifth grade. My daughter in seventh grade this year took enhanced math eight, and it was the first time she was ever engaged, challenged. Mm -hmm. She had a huge sense of accomplishment, a huge sense of pride in finishing that class. She thrived, she was excited about math for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to express that um, I had heard the district was looking at a new curriculum. I was happy about that um, and that they'd been spending a lot of time on that. But the first time that I've heard about a new math pathway has been in the last few weeks as some of the board members have also agreed upon. Mm -hmm. So this feels very rushed to me and I think it's something that we really need to look at. I would ask that the district, if they haven't already, look at best practices, what other schools have done this, has it been successful? I challenge you guys to look at the top 100 schools performing districts in the US and how many of these districts don't provide leveled or differentiated math in the middle school. I bet you can't find one. Um, and I also, in looking at the pathway up there, it's very surprising to me that we would go ahead and make changes in grades seven through nine without knowing what our end goal is. We need to figure out what we want in 10th through 12th grade first and then go from there. Um, so that's Thank it. you. Okay, I called this name before, but I, she may have gone home. Carol Karnick? Oh, maybe not. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi, I'm Carol Hi. Karnick. I live at 1806 Port Westbourne Place. I also have a child who just finished uh, seventh grade at CDM in the um, 
uh, enhanced math eight, and it was definitely the best and most challenging class that he had all year. Loved it, and um, I just I appreciate your expressing some concern about also their, you know, social growth and everything else than, and that happens and the pressure that they feel as they, um, you know, mm -hmm. go get older, and I, I think it just gets more and more and more mm -hmm. as they get into high school. But I can tell you that there was a tremendous sense of uh, pride and accomplishment that goes along with um, placing into this class mm -hmm. starting in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. He was super excited about it mm -hmm. when he found out that he was in it. It was a great year. And, you know, the, uh, the idea to him that he could be in an AP calculus and statistics class before he graduates from high school is, is thrilling. And there are children, he's, he, it may only be 15%, but that's, that's not really a very small number. And, and I challenge you to tell me that that 15% that those are the kids that the high school teachers are telling you cannot perform in high school. Those are not the kids that need the assistance that you're talking about. And I encourage you to adopt a curriculum that will help that other 85% of kids mm -hmm. get their math grades up mm -hmm. so that all of our schools mm -hmm. can do better in STEM and perform better in, against other districts in this country and in this world. But I, I don't think that these 15% of kids who are currently on the accelerated track are the ones who are not um, uh, benefiting from the status quo personally. And um, I think that uh, I have to agree with everybody, you know, looking at the high school track, it's, it's very important to understand where we're going with, with all of this before we make these changes in middle school. And I, I would ask you please to reconsider making any changes right now. I mean, right, my son's already grandfathered in, so it, it's not gonna affect me personally, but I really feel like for our whole community that it would mean a lot if you guys took your time with this and figured out um, the best way to go, looking at statistics and everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christy Lee and Christina Park. Good evening. My mm -hmm. name is Christy Lee, and I live at 1845 Port Barmouth. My, I have three children at Anderson Elementary, and my husband is the president of the Dean's Foundation that raises hundreds of thousands of dollars for Anderson every year, precisely so that we can have differentiated learning at Anderson. We can break out into different math classes and object, other subject classes by ability of the students. And so I am extremely disappointed to hear that the committee is recommending against continuing that on into middle school and um, who knows in high school. Um, I also, as a someone who has a degree in chemical engineering and will, was well prepared for that degree as a result of advanced math in seventh through twelfth grade in Texas public schools, I um, think it's extremely important to have a reasonable path to calculus for our students so that they can be competitive in these STEM programs. I've been a patent attorney for 17 years, and STEM is extremely important to the future of our society as a whole. I think that Mr. Drake said it best when he said there's no way to do five years of math in four years of high school. And that is precisely why we must start in seventh and eighth grade. Um, I'm also concerned with Dr. Navarro's repeated statements that the teachers were given the authority to make the decision on the curriculum and the implementation of the curriculum. I would have hoped that the board did not delegate its authority to make those type of decisions for our students to a small committee. Um, it is precisely this board's duty to oversee those type of decisions and to realize this decision on implementation is being rushed. There is not sufficient time to consider it when half of your plan is TBD. I ask, the ask that the board put this plan on hold for a year so that it can be properly studied. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Christina Park. I live at 33 Tidewatch in Newport Coast. Um, ditto everything everyone has said before me. My, <laughs> my family and I just moved here last summer from Connecticut with three young children, two of whom attend Harborview in Corona Del Mar. Um, you can imagine that a cross-country move for us was a major change. Um, on the plus side, you know, there's the weather in California living, but having lived on the East Coast in the top school districts, um, I guess there were a lot of things that I thought were a given that I took for granted. Um, things like manageable um, student to teacher ratios, 15, 20 to one ratios, weekly arts and music classes, including chorus, orchestra, band for grades four through 12, 
provided for by the school district, um, dedicated gate pullout classes at the elementary school level, and <laughs> differentiated tracks of learning. Differentiation is so important. Everyone here acknowledges that every child learns at a different speed and has a different approach to learning. So what happens when you teach to the average, especially in class sizes of 30 plus students? The faster learners will be bored and disengaged, while the um, folks who need more attention will be frustrated and also disengaged. No one does well when we teach to the masses and to the mean. Um, back in Connecticut, my oldest had an advanced um, math program, think SAT style problem solving. He loved it, he was challenged, he was motivated by his peers as well, who were also at the same age and maturity level. Um, I hate to say it, but here he was bored and disengaged with classroom math instruction. Thank goodness for Vian Nguyen, who spoke earlier. She ran and volunteered and taught um, math to the kids who um, uh, attended math club. My son was engaged, challenged, and learned deeply. Um, I would just say I've seen what the best public schools can offer our children. Newport Mesa Unified School District should be no different. We owe our kids um, the best and to be excellent for all. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Tara Riley Tong and Ann Parsnick. Hello, board. My name is Tara Riley Tung, and I live at 2306 Aurelia Street, and it's nice to see you all tonight. I'm going to try to be really brief. Um, I have girls who are going into junior year at CDM High School, and they've been placed into the enhanced path, and they're in um, a path that'll take them to AP Calculus during their junior year. My daughter was not a math whiz. She was smart, but not super genius. And now she wants to be an engineer. That wouldn't have happened if she was having to follow the path my son now has, who is an incoming seventh grader at CDM. And he's smart, but whether or not he passes into some test that he took two weeks ago, the school is telling us it doesn't matter what that test said. He's going to have to be in a path where to accelerate, he needs to do it in his sophomore or junior year. My girls are in that stage right now. It's the worst stage to be in as a high school kid. It's so hard. These kids are taking multiple AP classes, honors classes. They're getting ready for their college applications. They're taking SAT tests, ACT tests. Um, SAT subject tests. There's more tests than you can ever imagine because it wasn't like that when we were in high school. So the idea that we're going to make kids accelerate <coughs> during these years instead of seventh and eighth grade when it's easy and kind of fun is outrageous. And I'm sure the new curriculum is great if other teachers have seen it. I'm concerned about the acceleration path and so is everyone else here. I hope that you reconsider and give us at least a year to figure out what that path is gonna be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann Parzik. I'm at 2612 Wavecrest Drive in Corona Del Mar. And um, I've got two boys at, uh, at Harborview. One is uh, entering fifth grade and the other actually is gonna be starting at CDM as a seventh grader. And um, the seventh, the soon to be seventh grader was, uh, had, the, uh, had the advantage of um, being in Mrs. Haas's um, uh, math class this year. And it, she basically taught them seventh grade math. And I asked her just now during the break, because I've never met her before, and I, I thanked her and I said, um, so is he ready? Are they ready for algebra? And she said, absolutely. They understood what she taught them, they understood deeply. Um, they, they were able to, uh, you know, extrapolate and were able to, you know, move within these problems. They were able to understand the concepts deeply. And to, I just don't get why, I just don't understand why would, we would then force them to take seventh grade math all over again, which is what they did this year, make them sit, you know, twiddle their thumbs or worse, um, and then crush it at the end of high school when they've got, when they're looking at colleges, when they're, uh, they've got sports, it's get, everything's just, as the, all these high school parents have said, it gets more intense. Why would we drag it out and make them bored 
in seventh and eighth grade when they could have e evenly spread it out. I, I just, it just makes zero sense to me. And it's not about, I am not a tiger mom at all, just ask my <laughs> husband. I am fiercely, fiercely protective of my son's free time. And I will try to do so as long as I can. I, am, I love Race to Nowhere. I'm horrified by the pressure that a lot of these kids feel. This is not about pressure. It's not about that. It's about letting my child and the other kids who are, who are you know, like him in math move at their own pace. I have zero interest in forcing them to move past their own pace and pressuring them. This is where they are naturally, and just let them do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tara Tung. I thought so. I thought it was a duplicate. Did you fill it? Oh, she filled out too? Yeah. Okay. Just want to be sure. The other one had a middle name. Uh, Farad Edward. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last name. Karosravi. Uh, Karosravi. Yeah, okay. Karosravi. Yes. I have just that. Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, I live at 260 Santa Isabel Avenue in Costa Mesa. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of points that I attended the, uh, a little background about me. I am a uh, mm -hmm. civil engineer, structural mm -hmm. engineer with a graduate degree. And I have attended the schooling out of the country and in the country. So uh, I attended the meeting on Monday. And a couple of concerns that I had was the subject that they were cons they, they covered the areas as far as comparison purposes. Mm -hmm. And the data they uh, reviewed mm -hmm. were up in Bay Area, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I don't know how uh, they would uh, choose a district totally out of area when we have some good schools in the area that we can, you mm -hmm. know, look and maybe evaluate, maybe Irvine or some of the other high performers, I think that should have been something to consider. Then the uh, other points that I was going to say, uh, a lot of the items were covered today. I did a lot of the uh, before me speakers. And the, uh, let's see now, the couple of things that I want to say, I have two daughters. Mm -hmm. One is getting ready to go to college, so I totally I agree with the previous speakers that they right now are uh, going through all kinds of AP courses. And my uh, older daughter went through the uh, enhanced math. And the younger one who is going through the seventh grade is not going to have that opportunity, which is very concerning to me. Mm -hmm. That uh, when, they, when we attend the college visits, all the, like the UCLA's or uh, San Diego's or Harvard and Yale and those, mm -hmm. All of them are looking for AP classes at junior year, not mm. senior year that's being proposed. Okay, thank, thank you. <laughs> Amy Peters and Joseph Kurtz. Good evening, I'm Amy Peters. I've seen a lot of you a lot in the last couple of weeks. Um, I have three kids. My oldest just finished her first year at University of Chicago, and she was on the high math or accelerated math pathway. She was a Gate student, so she was required to be, I mean, you have to challenge her. That's one of the requirements of our education system in our district. And she's going to be able to double major in economics and philosophy because of the math she took at, in high school at Newport Harbor. Well, she did not have some of the gaps in knowledge that Mr. Clay is seeing, and that's because she didn't have SWUN. She didn't have all these math adoptions that we tried. My, the kids that Brandon Clay is getting now, they had SWUN. You know, they had eight problems during the school day and then eight problems for homework. Now, they had a two-hour block to teach math in grammar school. So my son, who's also a Gates student, he was challenged. He was given extra work because he needed to have extra things to do. He, dived, he was always diving into math. And it's so exciting to see how excited these kids are about math. And like a previous speaker said, all the math instruction does not happen at school. These kids are on their own going out and learning these things. 
Now, what I see, if we double up in math, you know, colleges only look at sophomore and junior year. If we double up in math, they won't be able to take these computer science classes. I can tell you those skills are going to be way more important than half of the other required classes that we are still requiring students to take, like health. We need to update our system. I'm not against illustrative math. I'm against throwing this in also, taking out the advanced pathway, because I don't really know illustrative math, but it seems like it's a pretty good system. But do we have to do everything at once? I think you know, part of the problem we've had is we don't scaffold it in. We just pull one out and put something else in. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Did Joseph Kurtz get a chance to? Kurt Kurtz. Sorry. <laughs> That's what happens when I call two names. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought I'd stay seated. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Kurtz, 2507 Blackburn Street, Newport Beach. Um, I won't talk about my super smart kid who was in Mrs. Haas's math class at Harborview also. Mm -hmm. I think everybody else has pretty well covered that. I'd drawn a little bell curve. Mm. Humans are always going to live on a bell curve. Mm -hmm. And those tails need to be addressed, the low tail and the high tail. And I'll leave it at that. The bulk in the middle with illustrative, hey, great, but let's not ignore the ends, and mm -hmm. particularly not this end. Uh, our country, mm -hmm. um, our tech sector, and our lead on this planet, mathematic, mathematical leadership is very important. Um, so I'm going to get off of that. I think everybody has said it 100 times. What I want to talk about is process, and for a change, I'm happy for, that there's social media. I found out about this less than a week ago. So did most of the people in this room. On a slide up there, I took great offense to a slide that said all input had been taken from parents, students, and teachers, because that's absolutely not true. So I take offense to that in particular. Transparency is what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Clearly, from the feedback, this proposal has not been thought through, thought through even to a concept level, much less to an implementation-ready level. It needs more time, and I highly encourage you to take the time to sort through how to improve overall test school for the middle of that bell curve and how to take care of those tails as we're taking care of them now. Thank you. Thank you. OK, the last two math cards, uh, Bree Winter, Winter Botham, there you go. And Catherine, ooh, what's that? Catherine, uh, P-I-E-S-T-C-H, Peach. Yep. Okay. Hi, my name is Bree Winterbotham, and I am at 1821 Port Abbey. Um, my, uh, I have a daughter that's in fifth grade. She's going into sixth grade next year at Anderson, and a son that is going into second grade at Anderson. Um, both my children attend uh, the School of Russian Math, mm -hmm. and uh, my daughter next year will be taking algebra and geometry at the School of Russian Math. Mm -hmm. Uh, the School of Russian Math, even themselves, they do have differentiated math classes. They have three different levels. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, you know, any school will be bored, if the children will be bored at the school if they do not have the differentiated math classes. Um, Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth said that Russian Math is one of the top ten schools um, and its students are some of the brightest young people in the world. And at... Uh, at uh, the School of Russian Math, 75% receive 600 and above when they test uh, the SATs, and this is for seventh grade kids. Mm. So um, also, uh, I want to please ask you to please reconsider doing this right now and please table this to reconsider what you're going to be doing for this. This is not something that should be rushed into. Again, what was said before by another parent, what has been done for math previously, um, some of those decisions have not been the best for our kids. That's one of the reasons why we're at the School of Russian Math. Um, this needs to be thought out. We need to know what's going on for the uh, high school years before we put anything in for mm -hmm. junior high. And this needs to be tabled, and we need to have transparency. We need to know what's going on before any decisions are made. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Hi. Hello.
Hello, everybody. Thank you for your time. My mm -hmm. name is Catherine Preston. Um, I live at 1621 Mesa Drive, number 69 in Newport Beach. Um, I have three children. Um, my oldest just um, finished Ensign and is going to high school. My middle is um, in fifth grade going into sixth, and my youngest is going into second grade. Um, my concern is I have a daughter, two daughters who mm -hmm. have special needs, mm -hmm. and we are not addressing that. We are not addressing the fact that we are gonna put these kids with special needs into middle school and have them do the seventh or eighth grade curriculum and not be able to succeed. I have a fifth grader going into sixth grade who cannot do second grade math. You're gonna expect her to go to seventh grade, be, maybe being in a third grade level and have her do seventh grade math, I think that's ludicrous. She needs to be able to do, and every child needs to be able to do, their work at their level. And it is not fair that you're making it equal for everybody because not every child is equal. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that these kids who don't have the foundation because of swan math or whatever, because of the crap that you guys have fed down our throats, um, now they're really struggling. And they're struggling so much. We're doing tutoring and everything on top of that, and it's still not helping. So we need to get on board here, put it aside, look through what we're doing now and make a strong foundation so that these kids can excel on another level. It's not fair just to say, I know everybody's here for accelerated people, but I'm here for my kids. They mm -hmm. need to learn to, to do math as well. And if we say that we're gonna just start them off at a level that's way above their heads, they're gonna sink more than anybody mm -hmm. else. And they're not gonna pay any type of person besides somebody who works at McDonald's. And that's not what my children want. My daughter, my oldest daughter, she wants to be in, an artist and she wants to be able to be a culinary artist and, mm -hmm. and she wants to do all these things. And my other daughter, she wants to be a vet, veterinarian. I can't sit there and look at them in the face and say, I'm sorry because your school doesn't want to do the right thing. You don't get to do that. Thank you. Thank you. The rest of the thank you. Oh, uh, uh, let me check real quick, okay? That's it. What about the rest of those cards? Oh, no, oh, here you put L cap, that's why L cap math. Okay, uh, you can come up and speak on math. We're still within the, the um, okay. Good evening, my name's Lori Smith. Um, I'm a retired Newport Mesa teacher, grandparent, and I have two children who went through the school district. Um, I am concerned not about the program. I think the teachers did an outstanding job picking this curriculum, um, Mr. Drake alongside them and the Orange County Department of Ed. I've read about the program. I've looked at the current research. As you all know, I like to research. I've been here before. Um, so I'm happy with the program. I think there are some good ideas here about slowing down the implementation and how we do the implementation. Um, I'm particularly concerned about class size. Again, the research, the NEA, everywhere you look, our class sizes are way too high. I've looked at the numbers um, throughout the district. Our classes in math are running in the middle school around 30-something kids. 38 at Ensign. That's way too high, particularly if you're gonna take this huge range of learners. Um, and yes, even if it's a great differentiated instruction, you're asking a lot of teachers, you're asking a lot of the learners to go in there in middle school, and they're a little squirrely in middle school. <laughs> 15 may be worse though, I get it, <laughs> with the parents who have 15 year olds. Um, but you're asking a lot of that in those huge classes. So if you redesign the implementation, look at class size. The bottom line is the money, okay? And we have the money. We've seen, I've followed for two years now, the money that's been wasted um, on facilities, poor decision making, consultants, lawyers, administrative leaves that were unnecessary. It has absolutely been shocking to me. It's millions. And we've gotta have correct management decisions and management of our tax dollars. There are money and we want smaller class sizes for our learners. That's gonna be the biggest difference of all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to the regular um, uh, uh, community yeah, community input. These people will be getting three minutes. No, 
we didn't find Wendy's cards. Uh, the first one is uh, Ruth uh, Kobayashi. Why don't you wait for a minute? Wait, wait. wait. Vicky, Ruth. Ruth just meant until they leave. Okay. Where, where are the cards We're go? Disgusting. Sorry. Okay. Ruth. Good evening. My name is Ruth Sanchez Kobayashi, and I can now say I'm the parent of two CDM graduates. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> but I'm still here because I care about what you're all doing, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I just, I know you know this, but I just wanted to reinforce that um, the City of Newport Beach City Council a week or two ago approved a third SRO for our schools in Newport Beach as a specific line item in their budget. It is imperative that the school board do the same and Dr. Navarro and yours truly's names were mentioned in that process, so no pressure at all. <laughs> um, working towards this is not enough. It needs to be done um, to be implemented this school year. And I just wanted to show you something really quickly, if I can um, bring it up, that why this is so important. Um, Sorry, a little technical difficulty here. Okay, so I meant to bring you a hard copy to show you and it stayed on the laundry room counter, but <laughs> I just wanna show you that um, I did the math on it mm -hmm. and I'm happy to email it to you, but 40% of the school hours at our high school have no SRO coverage. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I can show you the math on how I did that if you want that later. That's a huge percentage. And that's not because our SRO isn't amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing. Um, I also wanted to let you know that as a, uh, well, now retired front desk volunteer, I can assure you that our SRO does an excellent um, job training, safety training, active shooter training, um, which is mandatory for all of us, um, or you get kicked off the volunteer committee if you don't go. <laughs> uh, but I can also tell you that about half of the teachers have their ID visible to us. And even after doing this for three years, I'm not always sure who's who when they come in the door. So there's an opportunity for improvement. Um, I also want to um, thank you for implementing and committing to challenge success at the high school to evaluate the ways to improve our school and reminded of the challenge success observation that calendar change should be a simple change that can make a huge difference in the health and well-being of our students. I respectfully implore all of our stakeholders, parents, teachers unions, board members, and any other stakeholders I may not have thought of, that the students needs need to be above everything else and we'd ask for your support for the collegiate calendar and thank you for all you do for our students. Thank, thank you, you very much. May I real quickly? Uh, just I, gonna ask you to talk to them. Uh, Ms. Kobayashi, I just wanna uh, let you know that we are working on the contracts right now. So they're floating behind between the city and, and the district right now. So we'll, we'll get to it and we'll get it approved uh, this summer. And, and we're looking working with Costa Mesa. And we are working with Costa Mesa. They're in the process of hiring additional officers, so it's a work in progress right now. Marty O'Mara, budget. Oh, I guess I shouldn't, didn't need to say that. <laughs> Not math. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, Dr. Navarro, uh, President Snell, and trustees. Last week, I was trying to find some costs in your budget book. Mm -hmm. I did not find it a good read, Mrs. Yelsey. <laughs> At the last board meeting, after the presentation, there were only two questions, one on teachers' medical insurance and one on the election costs. Is that the only question, discussion you have on the budget? As I was looking for specific items in the budget, I found some very interesting information. You spend a lot of money on food. Mr. Lee Sung went from $103 to $5,000 for break room costs. That's $454 per month. Mr. Agostino went from $1,500 to $14,000. Travel, Mr. Lee Sung, these are just a few examples. Travel from $587 to $2,000. Conference travel from $700 to $5,000. Mr. Marsh, travel and conference from 10,000 to 18,000. Where are these costly conferences? Europe, Hawaii, 
Where can they be? What have you learned? What has been implemented? Give us some reports. Okay, well, another interesting perk. <laughs> Most principals and vice principals get a $3,250 mileage stipend. Elementary principals get $2,000 tax mileage. I only get paid for mileage with one university that I work for, and I'm sure I travel a lot more miles than any of those people. This is a small portion of the random information I found in your budget book. My original search was for the flagship signature academies. The district had at least three people receiving a salary from November to August in the year that these academies were proposed. I attended the final meeting in regards to those academies, and I remember varying figures to partially or totally implement those programs. The high being a million dollars, and I don't remember the low figure, but I know it wasn't <coughs> zero. I could not find any reference to any of the spending on these programs in the budget book. Also, I could f not find itemized special education costs, money spent on lawyers, money spent to send students to special schools after a lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera. However, you are approving $1 million tonight for Orange County Department of Ed special schools. I have personally supervised in many of those classrooms in the Orange County Department of Ed system, as I have observed in at least two also other out of district placements. I don't know the individual cases or whether the parents won lawsuits to send the children to those schools. I don't know all the details, but in my observing, I think many of those students on those schools could easily be serviced in Newport Mesa schools at another cost savings. Transparency, I am formally requesting a Thank study you, session I'm sorry. for the public on the budget. Thank you. Okay, moving forward. Uh, Megan, your, you are E. Okay, did I say it right? You are. Your, your. Hi, my name Hi. is Megan Your. I live at 504 Seaward Road in Corona Del Mar, and I wish I was here about math. <laughs> I, I wish that was my problem. Oh. But I'm a mother of a special ed student here in the district, and I have been in IEPs for the last two and a half years, and I have yet to receive a lawful IEP. Hmm. The IEP system is broken in Newport Mesa, it is, um, it is due to significantly powerful people who have been here a very long time, who are breaking the, the, the laws of IDEA and FAPE brazenly. It's out in the open. I have it recorded. I would beg you if you care about the, the special ed kids in Newport Mesa to listen to my videotapes. You will find law breaking of predetermination IEP is supposed to be a process. It's not supposed to be predetermined. It's against the law for it to be predetermined. If you listen to my recordings, all of my IEPs have been predetermined. So no matter what evidence is presented by whatever people, mm -hmm. it is not taken into consideration. It is not a fair and free IEP. Also, there's tremendous bias. I've talked talk to two teachers who will not say their names, but do not feel comfortable, do not, do not feel like they can express freely what they feel, like, like if, if the recommendation is one thing, they do not feel like they can freely express it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm requesting, I believe that the State Board of Education needs to audit all of your IEPs to see, mm -hmm. wait a minute here, look at all these IEPs and look at the recommendation. Was there ever an IEP that fulfilled the process and services were granted through the actual process of the IEP, meaning that they were given at the end of the IEP, not before? My recommendation, I'm, I'm told no before I even get to speak. I've been shut down in two IEPs where, it's, where I can't even speak. Mm -hmm. this, this problem is it's so devastating for the past two and a half years. It's been so stressful. I have four kids, I'm here tonight away from my children when I should be with my children, I should be with my special needs child. But the stress that, that this has put on me has been so significant. And I believe that all the special needs mothers of, and fathers of IEPs need to get together and we need a way to group together to fight this. And um, 
let me see if I forgot anything, but mm -hmm. I, I guess I, my point is there, but mm -hmm. I appreciate your time mm -hmm. and I'll, I'd appreciate so much if you would investigate this, read my IEPs. I have a report coming. I'll send it to all of you guys, but I really, really appreciate your time. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Do you want to respond? Do you want to respond to uh, Ms. Uh, Joachim, will you uh, follow up Ms. with Ms. Ewer? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're well acquainted and uh, we had a chance to, to speak at the break. Okay. And um, uh, so I will, um, we're, I, I think the issue is I'm following up on her individual case, but what she wanted to present to the board tonight was kind of a more global um, concern is the way I understand it. Yeah, it's really not for Sarah. Manager. There's there's people who have been here for way too long mm -hmm. who feel like they rule the IEP process and they are they brazenly break laws brazenly and i i believe that the only way to get a fair iep in newport mesa a lawful iep not even fair but mm -hmm. lawful mm -hmm. an a, a, a iep without being broken mm -hmm. is to get an attorney and therefore only the wealthy mm -hmm. in newport mesa unified school district can get a, a lawful iep okay mm -hmm. I, i'm mm -hmm. going to suggest you continue to work with Ms. Yoka, feel free. I have them. She's okay, lovely. good. Yes. And it, it, you know, and you're obviously you're free to go to the Orange County Board of Education wherever you feel you need to. We will look into your what you're saying. And you said that you. I can't continue to have a conversation yeah, okay. here, but yeah, send me what you said you had. Send okay, it I, to will. Us. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Wendy Lees. Um, I have five cards, but you have three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, good evening, Madam President, members of the Board of Trustees. Uh, my name is Wendy Lease. I did fill out other cards because I did want to speak on the safety and I wanted to speak on the math, and then I'll get to my point. Uh, on the safety, one issue that was not brought up, and it was a very good report, but um, I think the information is out there as far as uh, we were, were saddened by what happened in Florida and Texas, but it, you know, a lot of the information came afterwards on what, what they were posting on Facebook and Instagram and other websites that kind of gave everybody a heads up that these young people were in trouble. So there is a program. Uh, I talked to somebody this weekend who's in high security in the Navy, mm -hmm. and he was just telling me about a way that, that the technology can monitor the Facebook uh, postings in, in our school district. So I think that's something that would even get another layer uh, of, of assessing the risk uh, when somebody you know posts something that is threatening. Uh, on social media. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to talk about is regarding the, um, the program of illustrative math. Uh, you might want to write down this website. It's edreports.org. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's an educator-led evidence-based reviews of K-12 instructional materials, independent nonprofit designed to improve K-12 education. Free reviews of K-12 instructional materials focus on alignment to college and career ready standards and other indicators. And But uh, illustrative math is not even mentioned. I Several times no. today I've Googled or I've put in that. So I think when you're reviewing uh, this program, you need to also talk about why this program was uh, the one that you decided on, just like with SWAN. How did you come to that decision? And to that point, I would like to suggest that you uh, have a better system because you can see all the parents that were here and the ones I'm kind of speaking from the Costa Mesa side of town that that are want you to take your time and be more deliberative mm -hmm. on this transition into um, the, the, the K-12 math. But you need to have a study session. Having these meetings in the zones is not gonna be productive. You need to hear what these parents, and they need to be able to ask questions. And so having staff, just kind of what, the, what I didn't like about the districting thing was that you weren't there. 
you couldn't hear what people said about the boundaries. You had to hear it second or third hand from the staff. So um, you don't have a meeting on July 24th or August 14th. You might consider having um, study sessions then. Also, I, I was looking at the Riverside uh, Unified District. They have the dashboard on their website. So it's easy to plug in. And also, uh, we need to live stream these meetings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Real quickly, yeah. I just want to correct uh, Miss yeah. Lee. She's wrong about Ed reports. John, wasn't that what you showed from the Ed reports? Was the rankings or the their yes? The, the report that was in the slide was from Ed reports. Uh, illustrative math is um, produced. It's a it's a free open resource. Open up. Uh, resources produces their materials and so in ed reports the illustrative math ranking is under open up resources and, and miss Lees, we did have a study session on uh the progression of math it was last week we did have a study session i'm just saying you said we didn't have a study session we had a study session Ms. And, Snell, if, if I, and also <laughs> and also <clears throat> and the boundary when we had the boundary meetings we were at every meeting we weren't at the beginning meetings when we were doing uh, when we were putting it together <laughs> we were all at every hearing, meeting in every, every zone <coughs> or well uh, we every had hearing. every hearing anyway but thank you for your input we'll Russell, look into those other things dr lisa Russell Lee's had something to say. Oh, I, I just wanted to mention uh, what uh, Mrs. Lee's had talked about, about a, a service uh, that monitors social yes. media. Yeah, that's and, uh, and I did have this in my report, but I didn't elaborate on it, so oh, I'll, okay. I'll do that now. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an agency uh, called Okayak, and mm -hmm. it was on our that. partners and resources. Mm -hmm. And it's the Orange County Intelligence Assessment Center, yep. and they do exactly that. Oh. And so I, I think that's important uh, for folks mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. There is somebody uh, monitoring that, and we have seen that in action where they will pick up something and they will work with the local police department uh, with cooperation from our uh, school <laughs> officials. Uh, but 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 it, it's it's important. They're actually so they actually it. have individual. It's run through the FBI, and they actually have individuals from many of the police departments that are actually stationed at there. It's quite an interesting place. Okay. So moving on to Dr. Navarro, informational. Okay. Uh, you know, I just want to follow up on the safety issue. Um, we're exploring other avenues as well. I know that uh, Dr. Giacom has spoken, or Dr. Diagostino spoke with Dr. Eaton from USC, uh, and uh, they are piloting uh, an assessment that we can give to our students to see if they're in distress, mm -hmm. which identifies whether there are candidates to be uh, followed up on in case of possible danger to themselves or danger to others. So this would be a proactive approach. Right now we are collecting information from staff and we address it when a staff member has a concern or sees a sign that makes us uncomfortable about a kid, whether they're, you know, they're going to hurt themselves or someone else. This would actually uh, allow us to get out in front of it. So we're looking at what this has and uh, seeing how we come along. But it'll take us a while to assess whether it's effective or not. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, do you have any other? Information. <laughs> information you want to. Yeah, you're on here. Yes, I am. But uh, I think I'm. Uh, I will go on with the meeting. Okay. Uh, I, I think we've covered a lot today from a lot of reports. <laughs> covered a lot. Okay. So consent calendar. Okay. Move adoption of the consent calendar. Second. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read this by Ms. Mon I'm not going to read it. Latoya and seconded by. Um, Ms. Black, and all in favor? Wait, do we have Aye. any cards on it? I just wondered, nope. on the consent no. calendar? No, okay, mm -hmm. good. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> no. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Actually, all of the, the cards on consent were on the early part. Yeah. Okay, 15. Okay, we're a third of the way through. Um, 13, resolution consent calendar, um, 15A. Uh, move adoption of the resolution consent calendar as presented. That's adopt uh, resolution 3906-18, all funds final budget 
Adoption 400618, finding the 8th Summer School 2018 School Improvement Project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Uh, item 15C, adopt resolution 410618 to approve local agreement of child development services for contract CPKS 8058. Uh, dash zero zero with the California Department of Education for the state preschool program and 15 D <coughs> adoption of resolution 420618 to approve local agreement for child development services for contract CSPP 8352 zero with the California Department of Education for the state preschool program. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. Third. Judy can win. Judy. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so um, roll call. Uh, it's it's moved and seconded. Roll call. Moved by Mrs. Floor, seconded by Mrs. Franco. Ms. Snell. Yes. Ms. Matoye. Yes. Ms. Floor. Yes. Mr. Davenport. Yes. Ms. Franco. Yes. Ms. Black. Yes. Ms. Yelsey. Yes. Okay. So that. Carries. Um, 16 is public hearing action calendar. 16A is a public hearing on SELPA annual service delivery plan and SELPA annual budget plan for 2018 and 19 school year. Would you like to speak to this? Yes, I would. Okay. Thank you very much. You're so, um, as as it states on there, this is an annual process that um, every SELPA within California is required to follow. We are a single district SELPA, so uh, ours is just within our own district. And um, what what the state is looking for is um, to ensure that we're spending our state money and our federal money on special education. And as you are all well aware, um, we spend, um, the district contributes uh, a whole lot to our special education <laughs> program. So that's part of what the budget, um, it's kind of, it's a, an opportunity to give kind of broad strokes of where our special education dollars, how they're spent. Um, and then the annual service plan is um, kind of a snapshot in time of the services we provide at each of our school sites. Um, also our non-public schools and our residential treatment centers. And um, knowing that at any moment in time, if we have a student who moves into a school site that does not have services for the visually impaired, but that student is visually impaired, we move those services over there to support the student. So it just gives an opportunity to kind of see broad strokes of what, um, what support we provide in the district. Okay, so I am gonna open the public hearing for um, the SELPA annual service delivery plan and anybody who wants to speak to it can speak. Okay, I'm gonna close the Mrs. public. Mrs. Snell, <laughs> just, just so you know, this budget plan, um, Jeff Trader and I met with our community advisory oh, committee, mm -hmm. which is our um, special education parents, and they're the primary group who likes to have some of the information mm -hmm. on here. So, mm -hmm. um, so they were, we went over everything with them, so that may good. be why there's no one here. Oh, okay, good. So I'm gonna close the public public hearing, and then I need a motion. Move approval of the SELPA annual service delivery plan and the SELPA annual budget plan for the 2018-2019 school year. Second. Okay, <laughs> so it is moved by Ms. Matoye, seconded by Mrs. Floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, down to 17A. Um, discussion action calendar, uh, adopt the local control and accountability plan, LCAP. Vanessa, I think you need to go through the whole thing with us again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the exact, yeah. page by page, all 300. I feel somehow it's anticlimactic <laughs> at this point. Um, it is. But we, we really have nothing more to present to you other than to say that um, we have all the documents posted on the website, minus and a translated version of the LCAP, which will take us some time. Mm -hmm. But we do have our uh, short summary documents that we really encourage people to look at in both English and Spanish. And um, we're I'm, I'm working furiously with my um, neighbor next door, Annie Young Love, to think about ways we can make LCAP videos
Oscars next year. Oh. Um, so we're very excited about the prospect of doing some of that to really showcase the amazing things that are happening, but with the lens of, of how they're um, articulated through the LCAP. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or comments about um, questions? the plan itself. I um, think we just want to, I think I just want to say thank you again mm -hmm. for a wonderful job and and being able to take something that was really complicated and, and make it very understandable, even though it may take three hours. Uh, yes. I, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, I just would like you to address um, <laughs> the, the Hanover par portion of it, the research um, group mm -hmm. that we've hired to, to administer the surveys and mm -hmm. collect that, because I know that in the past that has been one of our major concerns was not receiving and getting enough data from, I mean, Certainly. when we first started the LCAP, we were out there in the community mm -hmm. you know, with thousands of meetings, and now we have um, adopted a, a new process because it's just so time consuming. And I would just like you to address um, where we are with the in improvement we've made and sure. where we're going to continue to focus on. Sure. So it sounds like you're asking for two different things. One is about the stakeholder input piece itself, yes. and the second is just about the research mm -hmm. portion of it. Exactly. So the stakeholder input piece, what we've really done is not gone to the zone-wide approach, but thought that the, the best information is received at the, the district at the site level for the purposes of the plan. And really, when you think about the LCAP, the, the actions and services that most people see are at their school sites. And so we see it as embedded in the process of thinking about their school plan. So we've asked the school sites to work with various groups as they're able. And so it's not asking them to give every school site council and every PTA and every single um, committee, but really thinking almost like the, what they call matrix sampling, that through asking whoever can participate, we're going to get some ELAC, we're going to get some PTA, we're going to get some school site councils, and we'll continue to look at who's producing which results. And if you look at the stakeholder input sheet, you'll see that that's exactly what we got, a variety of, of input. Um, so on the, and then additionally, we do uh, meet with the required groups, um, the bar bargaining units and um, the DLAC and our superintendent's parent advisory um, and then our principals of course uh, and our ed services leadership team and then our colleagues in student services so we're making sure that we're getting input throughout the way and, and that way. Uh, in previous years we have done a Google survey, a Google form which was not exactly scientific and then from there we transitioned and we um, worked with the Orange County Department of Ed um, Evaluation and Data Center and we worked with them for a few years and they did both a survey and they also one year did a focus group for us. And then one of the things that we decided we wanted to pursue was a different approach in the research. And Hanover um, does not just do surveys. They do a lot of different kinds of study, and they also provide a research bank that we are able to, to look at and see what other districts have done. Um, so we, had particular, had seen the pr presentation from Irvine, and we know that a number of different um, districts in Orange County and throughout the state work with Hanover. So um, just as, as you may imagine, not everything that is done in this district is embedded in our LCAP. But for the pieces that we do um, work with Hanover on LCAP specific things like parent engagement and like the survey, we have those components included. And so we have ongoing studies that we're working with them. In fact, we have the parent engagement study that's continuing now. So they did the survey for us and it included both the um, online administration of the questions and then looking at the data and providing us the report that's posted on the website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was uh, great. Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, I just want to also thank you for all the work you put in, especially taking each of us through the LCAP <laughs> and working closely with Jeff. And it just made me think, I take exception to the speaker that came up before and said we don't ask questions mm -hmm. about the budget. Uh -huh. Obviously, a lot of what's in the budget is based on the LCAP, and we went through that thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted Multiple to, times to say, you know, thank you actually to both of you. Mm -hmm. for Great, thank you. Mrs. It really Black. has been a pleasure working with um, Jeff Crater. He really has been very collaborative, and um, I've appreciated that relationship. <laughs> Mrs. That, Black. That, I was just going to say mm -hmm. the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, sitting next to great minds we are. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, but I do, I, it's the first time we've actually collaborated where you can actually see the nexus, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's fabulous. So mm -hmm. great. Appreciate. It. I know it wasn't easy. And uh, very so time consuming. Very time wow. consuming. But I think it's just a wonderful document, and and I think we will be embedding some things in the future. So yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for that. I appreciate. Absolutely, it. my pleasure. And Miss Matoya. And I guess it it is like mine saying close mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. The summary document mm -hmm. for those mm -hmm. people out in the te television world that want that, that want to see it. it that summary document is so really valuable mm -hmm. and so concise and so readable. Mm. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Very I do helpful. appreciate Thank that. Thank you.
Just wait for the videos. I will move. That should be so fun. I will move. Okay. Second. Um, to adopt the. I'm sorry, Wayne. Oh, let me look. I'll look. She had her three minutes to talk about various priorities. I know, but I thought discussion action they could talk on a particular item. Yes. yes. I, I'm, I didn't notice. In the 12A. 17. Then I'll step Maybe aside. 17A. Okay. Um, oh, Mrs. Lease. Yes. I combined my comments from the other, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I went mm -hmm. ahead and, um, mm -hmm. oops, because I find it fascinating, I put, I, I three hole punched the whole 300 pages. <laughs> it took so me, did I. like, I, I mean, I didn't I get did through too. the whole thing. But a couple points that I'd like mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. is that Irvine's is just 169 pages, not 300. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit too much to ask, uh, you know, the community to read this this much material to understand where the money's going. I think Mr. Trader does an awesome job of, of combining the two uh, so that you don't have to read the budget completely. You can read the LCAP to really mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. where the money's going. Um, I think I forgot my other piece of paper. Um, but a couple points. Uh, w the reason I mentioned the dashboard is because the LCAP refers back to it often. And I'd like to see more blue than green and then orange, especially in those West Side schools. So I'd like to recommend that you take some of the money, and I know that some of the money's kind of been over budgeted. Uh, in that one column and, to, and put a school facilitator at each school that, that rather than ha them having to go to here and there is that that would help that school <clears throat> community do better, especially those West Side schools. Um, there's too much orange in, in, on the West Side and it's time to, to do whatever it takes to, to lift it up. And I think uh, having worked for the county, uh, pair educators, and I noticed you hired 19.5 uh, to go back in the classroom. Good, but we need more because it's that one-on-one -on -one instruction. We want those kids to be able to learn by the time they finish third grade. And um, so I, I commend you for the LCAP. I, I just wish it was a little bit shorter, but maybe you can work on that next year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. Um, uh, may may I just make a comment real quickly? Um, one of the things that uh, there's a difference between uh, Irvine and uh, our district. Uh, we are above the uh, county average and above the state average on our rankings with the state testing. Mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the schools that are above the, the county uh, average, we have the largest uh, unduplicated count, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. We're almost at 50%. There's nobody with more students on duplicated count than Newport Mesa that's above the county <laughs> average. So the reason you might have a smaller uh, uh, LCAP in a district like Irvine is they don't have as many mm -hmm. unduplicated yeah. count students. Uh, so our program, our, our document's gonna be much, much more specific about what we're doing for the, all those populations. Um, and we've been, at, we've, been, we've been above the county average uh, before I even got here. So we continue to be there and we have the largest unduplicated count population. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. So uh, we still would like them. We move we to be successful. Absolutely. We Absolutely. We move, uh, Mrs. Black moved and Mrs. Franco seconded. Mrs. Oh, thank you. Second. Okay, so now we can take a vote. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, 17B, approved contract with Next Gen <coughs> Science Innovations for 2018-19 school year for secondary science. Uh, Mr. Drake, do you have any comments? Yes, yeah, just okay. uh, mm -hmm. briefly I will let you know mm -hmm. that for the past uh, year, our science uh, grade level teams all the way through high school have been working on creating units uh, around the next generation science standards. They've done a fabulous job, um, you know, ending their units with a uh, common lab experience for kids and, and so <laughs> forth, with a real eye on, on making sure that they're incorporating not only the next generation science standards, um, but the teaching techniques that go along with that. 
Um, and so they've asked for this next year um, for NGSS, or Next Generation Science Innovations, which is a group of curriculum writers and professional developers to come in for five different sessions um, with curriculum that they've written um, in, in showing the, the um, instructional delivery of, um, you know, building off of phenomena <coughs> and, um, you know, d dialing into students thinking scientifically. Um, so each of the grade levels will get five different sessions um, with this group uh, with the intent that um, they'll be able to walk away with those lessons at, to not only use in their classroom but replicate as they continue to learn and grow around next generation science standards. Okay, do we have any any questions? I know we've heard of this before. <laughs> okay, we already had a report on it, yeah. Um, okay. Um, move adoption. Who, who wants to do that? I will. Second. Okay. I get to read it though. Approve the contract with Next Gen Science Innovations for the 2018-19 school year for the secondary science. Second. Okay, so moved by Mrs. Matoyer, seconded by Mrs. Black. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, 17C. Um, approve agreement with the University of California Irvine History Project for textbook adoption support for social studies history. <laughs> Move approval of the agreement with the University of California Irvine for the history project for textbook adoption support for social studies dash history. Second. Okay, would, would you like to say something? <laughs> yes. The only thing I will say is that we are off and running. We've actually yeah. spent uh, three days this year with our, um, our steering committee. Uh, we didn't have the luxury of ed reports, so we spent mm -hmm. that time developing their lens around the evaluation tool um, and the shifts in, in history social studies, and they've already chosen um, their uh, materials, that are the, the, the publishers that they will pilot starting next year in Irvine, um, uh, project will come and help us with that process. Ah. Okay. For what grades? So six through eight, and I can read you the publishers. Uh, six through eight will be piloting McGraw Hill Education um, and National Geographic Learning. Um, grade ten will be piloting Pearson, um, Scott Forsman, and, and uh, Prentice Hill. Their California World History. Grade 11 will be piloting National Geographic's Learning uh, U.S. History American Through the Lens and also Pearson's uh, California United States History of the 20th Century. American Democracy in 12th grade will be piloting McGraw-Hill Impact California Social Studies and uh, the TCI, Teachers Curriculum Institute, Government Alive. And that, that was, that's for American Democracy and, and Grade 12 Economics will be piloting McGraw-Hill Impact California Social Studies and National Geographic Contemporary Economics. So the reason it's called Im California is because it's, it's directly oh, geared towards, go. I'm sorry, no, 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 is go. directly because it's written for California. It's not that it's a different history. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's written to our um, standards. Our, our standards. Yes. Okay. I'm kind of thinking, man. Okay, so we knew we, um, <laughs> we um, it, this uh, approval was uh, moved by Mrs. Floor and seconded by Mrs. Black. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Okay, 17D approved 2018 19 declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Ms. Olson, if yes. you want to. Yes, elaborate. just quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the annual declaration that we submit to the CTC in the event that we um, are unable to fill certain posi um, specific positions. It also declares that we are going to do a diligent search in order to fill it with fully credentialed. And so th we, this past year we have only had to use it a few times, so the numbers are a little bit larger than what we used. Uh, but we certainly don't want to have to come back and um, have it approved again if we were needed more. Okay. Um, who, uh, moved by move no. approval? Up, move approval of the 2018-19 Declaration of Need for Fully Qualified Educators. Second. Karen, second. <laughs> Mrs. Yeltsin. Okay, <laughs> so moved by Mrs. Matoye, seconded by Mrs. Yeltsin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, 17E. 
first reading and adoption of board policy revision. Yes. <laughs> so uh, staff will take you through these and they'll uh, let the board know which are just uh, changes required by changes in law and statutes and then which are a little more involved. So Leona is first. Yes, thank you. And we're going to go in a little bit different order. I'm mm -hmm. going to do the ones that are just minimum changes, and okay. then Phil is going to come up and present the more extensive changes. <laughs> so the board policies that are before you tonight were all prompted with changes in the education equity ed code 200 series. Um, in particular, it was the pupil protections related to immigration and citizenship status. So as we look at several of these policies, you will see we are, one, we are updating from governing board to board of education to be consistent with our other board policies. And then we are adding immigration status. When we, when we did this, we also knew, noticed that in a couple of the um, policies, pregnancy is left out. So we just updated that at the same time. So going through this first one, those were the only changes. And then you can note at the end, the legal reference, we are adding the reference to um, what prompted the change. So that is board policy 410. Looking at the next one, oh, sorry, did you have questions on that one? Do, do, so do we approve these individually or as a group? Because we can do it. We I think it. the ones that we're talking about with just our uh, statute uh, updates, we'd like to go over as a group. Okay. And maybe the ones that are a little more involved, we can do one by one. Okay, so this would be, oh, I'm sorry, what? BPO410. So now we'll go into a couple that come under the personnel, which are the 4,000 series. So the first one, non-discrimination in employment, BP4030. And in this one, there is only the immigration status change. And then again, we added, we did do a clarification here to be consistent with some of other our other board policies to um, put in the discipline separate from and identify it separate from the paragraph above. And in this particular one, we did find that some of the ed codes, they haven't changed in meaning, but some of the um, numbers have changed. So that's why you see the cross outs there. And then you see the new list indicating the change there. So was discipline already in this one? Oh, OK. Yes. It was yes. called out, though. OK. Then in, again, this is for the 4,000 series, again, dealing with personnel. You'll notice the, the three numbers there to indicate the different classifications. In sexual harassment, we have the update of Board of Education and then the immigration status. I do believe we added in the discipline here, too. Mm -hmm. The verbiage was there. The title was not. Okay. And again, adding in the changes um, where the changes in, um, occurred. Do we have to um, make a discipline in red, or does it not matter if we if we it, added it? It'll be in black. Uh, I thought if eventually. we added something, it was in red. It isn't. It depends who's adding it in the program oh. itself. So oh. when um, Kathleen Hedges works on it, it shows up um, the blue. But when we're doing the oh, strike blue. through, then okay. it's red. Okay. So it looks like those. Four or five um, are should you'd like because they're just they're minor changes. Of their minor changes are all based on the new laws that came out. So yeah, and there's a couple more that have minor changes. Okay. There's actually only two that are extensive. So if you okay. s jump to now we're into oh, the student fifty one forty five fifty one thirty one point two under bullying. Mm -hmm. Again, this is identifying the group of immigration status. In the protected Leona, class as well as pregnancy. Sure. <laughs> 5131. Yes. Okay. 5131.2. Okay, Sorry, I just. Mm -hmm. So, Board of Education is updated, and then we have added the immigration status as well as the pregnancy under the bullying component. There were some other minor changes in this one as we read through it. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I am on the cyberbullying paragraph where we added the device, the electronic device, and or assuming person's identity. Right. So 
clarifying oh, that nuance. Okay. I thought I saw that, and then I didn't see it on here. It's and because it's not it's, in red. It's hard to see the blue. It is. It's okay. hard to see the blue. Especially at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So going through the rest of it, again, under complaints and investigation, making the change that one may report to being stronger of one should report the behavior. Mm -hmm. And then capitalization changes. Yes. And then the ed code references. So the next one, 4145.3. Under students, non-discrimination harassment, so we are adding in the protected classes, immigration status and pregnancy. And then at the, you will see the discipline in blue, it might show, <laughs> mm -hmm. I do know that that's difficult to see. And then indicating the specific ed code that prompted the change. Fifty one four five point seven. Update with Board of Education. There is some capitalization on the second paragraph. And then we get into the protected classes, Board of Education update, and then immigration status and pregnancy. Oops. And I can't see my pages on here, so I'm sorry. Um, so it, on the second page, you will see that we changed to be consistent, oh, discipline. changing disciplinary action to discipline. Mm -hmm. yes. And then the changes of the references to the Ed Code. Mm. And then moving to 5145.9 on hate motivated behavior, similar changes actually identical changes, <laughs> adding in discipline. And just to note, we're not adding discipline. We're adding Sorry. the word, I'm yes. just for the, we're you adding the word it. discipline. The content was already there. We just we titled. We added a title to that to section. Find. Yes, okay. and consistent with the other policies. Right. <laughs> exactly. So with that, I will ask. Well, well let's uh, go ahead and so perhaps move these. I think I, I wrote them down, so correct me if I'm I did wrong. Too, so okay, I'm so mm -hmm. um, move adoption of board policy 4010, 4030, 4119.1, 4219.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 4319.1, 
5145.3, and 5145.9. Yep. Yes. Moved by Mrs. Floor and seconded by Mrs. Matoyer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Those carry. Now we're moving on to these middle ones. Good evening, President Snell, Vice President Matway, members of the board, Dr. Navarro and Cabinet. I'll be asking you to move uh, after we review board policy 5111 mm -hmm. and 5111.1. So uh, these two board policies are being revised uh, in light of AB 699, <coughs> as well as directives from Attorney General Becerra's office that require us to make sure that we are compliant with uh, rights and opportunities for uh, the children of immigrants to have access to a free and appropriate public education. So there was language that was recommended by the California School Boards Association. We've adopted that language. And so with your permission, I'll just quickly go through. Mm -hmm. uh, the first changes are simply clarifying that, that we announce and publicize the timeline process for enrollment. We do that in our annual notification uh, that our staff are trained and um, that we also give information about healthcare options, um, that we do not discriminate against any children, um, that our healthcare coverage uh, is uh, available and, and um, information is provided to families throughout that process. We then go into verification of admission eligibility. Um, we do not request documentation of a student's social security number. Um, we put in language uh, that was recommended by CSBA concerning the collection of information, how we would collect that information and how we would process it if we were to do that. Uh, I don't think we do collect that information um, in any way as far as I know. Uh, and then uh, at down at the bottom here, you'll notice this is the language <coughs> that we will see uh, regarding um, that we're protecting the rights mm. of, of uh, the children of, of immigrant families. And then we've updated the, in this particular board policy 5111, we then scratched all of our previous uh, legal references and we then updated uh, legal references cur uh, consistent with CSBA. And that is down uh, through the rest of that particular document. Yeah, here you added that one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that would be 50, 5111. And then mm -hmm. with respect to 5111.1, as you know, we're a locally funded district. Uh, we have a duty and an obligation to uh, make sure that all the students that are enrolled in the district reside within the district's boundaries. And so that the funds that primarily come from property taxes are expended on those students and families that reside within the district. So this is an important board policy. Uh, we got language in here about um, requiring uh, district residency. Uh, we also um, put language in about annual notification about attendance options. Uh, we also put in uh, notification about documentation, um, requiring documentation for students' residency, that we will require that, and uh, <coughs> that we can deny enrollment when, uh, when documentation is insufficient. Uh, you might remember that um, we early on uh, years ago uh, went to adding language in our board policy about investigation of residency. We've tightened that up a little bit with some of the language that you'll see here. Um, we've got language in there about how and when we initiate an investigation uh, that we may use to train employees, that we could use contracted employees as well. Uh, we do have notification in there that uh, Employees or contractors would identify themselves as such during the course of an investigation. And then we have a section on an appeal of enrollment denial. And that goes through a process of notification. We, we, have, a, uh, we have an initial appeal that comes to the Director of Student Services. Uh, and this is all spelled out in the administrative regulations, but just to let you know, we have an initial appeal that goes to the Director of Student Services. If it's denied, it then gets a hearing uh, by a face-to-face -face hearing by the Director of Student Services. 
I then share that information with the assistant superintendent and then a decision is made at that point. Uh, that would be the end of the process at this particular level and then there is a language requirement in all of our notifications that there is a right to appeal to the County Board of Education. We did have one appeal this year and um, we prevailed in that appeal. I think that's because of our, our board policies. Um, we then finally, in closing, um, we've got some language in here that was added with respect to um, um, students that can be allowed to be remain in our schools. We do let students stay till the next natural break. Typically, that's the winter recess or the spring recess or the end of the school year. Uh, you also have administrative regulations that allow us to make exceptions for students who have started their sixth grade year, their eighth grade year, and their 12th grade year, mm. uh, who, if they're finishing out that year, transitioning from elementary to middle, mm. or middle mm -hmm. to high, mm -hmm. or high, and, and exiting out and graduating, they can stay for the entire year as well. And then we also updated um, codes and uh, legislation that pertains to this particular issue. Mm. So that is pretty much the substance of 5111 and 5111.1. And so with your permission, I would love for you to approve those. Move approval of 5111 and 5111.1. Second. Second. In one reading. In, in one, one reading. In one reading. You're going all the way to the end with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. we don't have to come back. So it'll just, we'll just prove it in one reading. In one reading. Okay. Um, so the first one we did wasn't, we didn't say that. We didn't say approve in one reading. We just approved it. Well, we're saying it in this one. Okay. Uh, so uh, the motion um, ha that has been stated by Mrs. Floor, seconded by Ms. Matoye. All in favor? Aye. No. Okay. I think I Mrs. Mrs. Yelty. Mrs. Yelty. I apologize. Mrs. Black seconded. Okay. I, I, okay, I have that down here. It's late. <laughs> really late. Mrs. Yelsey and seconded by Mrs. Matoye. Mrs. Black. Mrs. Black. Mrs. Black. Mrs. Black. That's okay. Is All she... in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So it Thank is you very much. In one Thank you. reading. Can I yes. amend? These were great yes. too. I would like to amend our previous approval so that we can say we like, approved it in one reading. We need to bring it back. We yes, need to bring it back for a vote. I, need, I would like to bring, bring it back for another vote. vote. Yeah, to amend it. To amend it. All those numbers. All yeah, Don't just approve all policies in one minute. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. all policies so all presented them. today. Yeah. I would like to move that we bring back to a vote all policies that were presented today in one reading. In 17E, how about that? In 17E. <laughs> Thank you. I'll second that. Thank you. We have a move by Matoye and a, a second by, by Black. Mrs. Matoye and a second by Mrs. Black. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So now we're going on we to, to board up. member reports, and we're going to start with. <laughs> um, it was a great end of the year, fabulous mm -hmm. promotions, graduations, awards nights, all those things we had since two weeks ago, which seems like forever now, um, but it was wonderful. Great end of the school year, and I know as the, uh, as the high schools say right now, they're already starting this year, the day school ended, so yeah. that's where yep. we are. Ditto, and um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Drake, because he's been, you know, fabulous in giving us the information, um, and I know what's been on your plate, and uh, it's been amazing. so. I appreciate that, and I hope that you understand that the community does too, as well. It's just I think we need to. Hopefully, we're going to move in that direction. It's not necessarily transparency because I've had access, so I think it is transparent. But it would be nice, you know, to be able to study it and bring our community in, you know, like. Mrs. Yeltsin said, not to put you on the spot, but I do appreciate all that hard work because it is a lot of hard work. You know, we have a lot going on. Normally, we have one adoption once a year without new standards. You know, so this is this has been a huge undertaking, and and I just really want to make sure that we don't dumb it down. You know, for all kids. I mean, that is the only reason why I'm on this board is to ensure that, that happens. Mm -hmm. So our kids are up for it. So. Thanks for listening. 
Ditto. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. um, the graduations and promotions mm -hmm. were tre tremendous. Mm -hmm. They were the speeches that the kids oh, did man. Oh, man. at <coughs> all levels oh, were fabulous. fabulous. Um, I p will probably always remember the uh, speech that the one boy did from Ensign when he said, I did it my way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and that, you know, it's Made just something saying, that I yeah. think they all did. Um, it was it was really moving, and I want to thank many of you who decided to, to mention the fact how many years I'd been there. Um, <laughs> well, you're graduating too. You're graduating. <laughs> yeah, you're graduating <laughs> it was it was a long time, mm -hmm. and it has been very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. It has been very interesting at times, and it. Uh, very rewarding at other times. So, thank, thank you for you your all. service. Mm -hmm. And that's my whole thing. Okay, take the summer off. <laughs> I wouldn't attempt to improve on what's been said. Oh, no, no, it's tough. <laughs> Mrs. Floor. Yeah, the graduations. Um, please thank the principals. Uh, for fabulous graduations and thank the principals of the middle school for moving the middle schools all to one day and you know so that each each great you know the eighth graders could celebrate on their day and uh, and the, um, the the high schoolers could graduate on on, on another day that was um, just fabulous I also had the opportunity to participate um, in a, a promotion ceremony at Ray Elementary School um, sixth grade, the sixth grade, um, Dwayne Cox invited me to, to attend. Um, what marvelous, and they put, they did a video, and it was student run. Um, a fir first time opportunity, it was absolutely fabulous, and I would love, um, each kid was presented, and they talked about the different ones, and marvelous, marvelous speeches. Um, and also, uh, Cantrell uh, photography. Uh, photography produced and gave it to the, so each student got a graduate uh, promotion certificate with their high school picture that was frameable. Um, has a really very lovely touch in their Wanda. Uh, well, their their sixth, sixth grade, oh, their oh, sixth oh, grade oh, oh. was a was a, a picture, okay. um, and it had the certificate. And then also, I wanted to thank uh, Veronica and everyone for the the awards night. It was fabulous. I, it's it's disappointing that we don't have as many parents attending um, and students and so I hope that we can do a, 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 a rethought of how how to get to more. promote that how to get more out um, especially when the last two weeks of school I think every single one of us there was an award ceremony every single night and every single day sometimes twice and so it was but it was fabulous and I commend those wonderful young men and women who are going into the military um, Estancia had six uh, Harbor had uh, Harbor had a number of students Costa Mesa had several um, and Newport and Corona Del Mar did too and so it was quite um, quite enjoyable and there's one young man going to Annapolis is it Annapolis? Annapolis Annapolis so that was just unbelievable so great did those <laughs> Um, I also was pleased um, to attend a couple of performances that still lingered on mm -hmm. after, during all of this. And one was the uh, Costa Mesa High School song, uh, or uh, uh, choir performances of Songs of Stage and Screen, which was so much fun, <laughs> so much fun. and that I was able to also attend Costa Mesa's baccalaureate, and I'm very proud of us that we still have it. And, yes. And it, it's it's a really wonderful place to be with the seniors because it's a much more intimate setting, and it, it, you feel really proud. of. It's like one of the first things where you can say, yay, you guys, you did it. And I, too, went to um, some sixth grade promotions, one at College Park and one at Wilson. And the pride of promoting to sixth grade is just... It's so fun, but I have a tendency to want to dial back because it's like, well, don't burn yourself out now. You've got high school. <laughs> you are all going to go to high school, so don't worry. You won't miss out on anything, but it's, it's wonderful 
to see how nervous and excited the sixth graders are about going to middle school. And so I tried to calm them down. Your turn. Okay, well, uh, one of my favorite things that I did was go to the talent show at Adams. And I think I told you all that it was, it's still being run by Mrs. Diane Bontheus. <laughs> Uh, it's her 25th year, and uh, so it was. I was reliving my little <laughs> my little kids in the talent yeah. show, and and they're just uh, you know s talent. I'm not sure, but <laughs> they're so fun to watch. Yeah, it was really really cute, and it was it was really nice. I I really enjoyed that. Um, Cinderella, another yes, I mean, um, Nick Saint Royal production at California School. I can't believe the first and second <coughs> graders, they were, are very talented, and he just can get so, so much out of them. Uh, the CDM Living History Luncheon, that okay. was huge. We all were there, I think, and it's just so moving. And, and the CACT, lovely. They did a great job, and I, I kept thinking, uh, I wish that um, all teachers could experience that love and uh, I know that, that parents feel that for what they do for their children. We heard a lot of it tonight, but I wish all teachers could experience that love the way those teachers experienced it that day. So it was really, um, really a wonderful few weeks. And I, and I, I, I have a question about the math issue. Um, okay, so the way we kind of left it is, um, we're going to send um, Mr. Drake out to do some more community, um, a few more community meetings. But um, how soon do we have to decide to have the right people in place? And I mean, we can't. We're going to debrief uh, after today. Okay. And, oh, good. Uh, Thank you. So uh, we'll get back to you on, on what we, we, what we take. Especially, you know, we didn't even we talk about need, it. But we all listening, need, listening to the community and... Um, you know, I, I don't know, I just... Well, you know, and nothing was brought up, but we have to be respectful of the teachers because we have to talk about placement. I mean, there's master scheduling that has to go on at these at these schools in terms of, of So we need classroom. to discuss it. I think we need yeah, to so. discuss it more and um, soon. So, <coughs> so not sure how we're going to do that, but... Um, We'll, 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 we'll debrief, debrief first and, and then we'll get, get back, back to you. us and figure out what we're going to yeah. do. Okay. That's all. You have your committee? Oh, we're ROP. Oh, committee. Um, a couple of exciting things. Of course, you know that the governor signed the budget and allotted 100, not the 300 million, but $150 million, and it is ongoing. The other 150 is going to go to the community colleges, but with the understanding that it's supposed to go to K-12. Yeah. But the big significant thing is that um, the CTIG has continued, and it's, it's right now it's forever. Um, so it's 150, there will be 150 million, it'll be the same process, it looks like we'll probably, you know, all of the ROPs. And the other exciting thing, and I want to gauge whether you'd like to also participate and in, in work with them, um, our executive director will be meeting with um, Carol Hume and, and the team to come up with what, what we're for our school district and what we want to offer. Um, but I know that Huntington Beach, uh, had a meeting and scheduled a meeting not only with Carol and and uh, and J S Coke, but also their entire board was had a there was sort of like a study session so that everyone could get a flavor of what what's offered and a clear understanding. And if that's something that this board would be interested, I can take it back to Carol and see whether we can schedule something along those lines, um, so that all of us are briefed at the same time about what's what's going on. But. So those are the two exciting things uh, that are that are happening now. In comments to what you just reported, I would I would love not 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 real soon, but I would love a study session or a report that lets us know what's being offered, what schools are there being offered at, because we talk about it, we talk about it in bits and pieces, but I, I don't get a big flavor. I will send you the re I'll send you the report. We have that. Okay, I'll, I will send you the that report of all the all the classes that Thank we're offering. Thank you. Anybody else have any reports? Okay. 
I don't have any additional information except mm -hmm. to uh, clarify one point that was made earlier about middle school class size. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it was mm -hmm. out of context mm -hmm. without any other uh, information. Uh, I do want to let you know that, and we shared this before, uh, Laguna Beach has a smaller middle school class size, mm -hmm. and then we're right up there, and I think we flip-flop back and forth with Garden Grove. So it's <coughs> not, you know, we're second or third, depending on which subject you're looking in at. The county. In the county. So, uh, yes, we'll, we're looking at that, and uh, uh, the smaller class size does lend itself to the block schedule at the two high school, 712s, uh, but uh, we're looking at it. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, this is Ms. Okay. Mr. Holcomb. No reports? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Play your report. Yeah. I have a report. Oh, yay! Okay. Okay. <laughs> we like that when you have reports. You already had a report. Well, I, I wasn't planning a report, but you mentioned, uh, you know, future board reports and mm -hmm. mentioned Ray. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to let you know that we, we've all been hearing just some amazing work at Ray. As you know, a couple of years ago, we made a very important decision as directed by the board, and they are now an avid school. Uh, they're two years into that process. They are learning um, a center model school, and we were actually hoping to bring them here to you to report their progress, mm, oh yeah. but we had far too many things here at the end of the year. So I promised them, and so I'm promising mm, you good. that we will bring them back in the fall. They're excited to tell their story and all the wonderful things that are going on. So uh, a, a little something to look forward to and when we come back in the fall. Good. You know, I just wanted to ask briefly, um, uh, we had a speaker that talked about having a special ed student that is, would be mainstreamed into to math, to math uh, seven and her concern that she would not get support. Well, uh, the I in IEP stands for individual. So it's always what the, each individual student needs. And um, typically, you know, there's uh, specialized academic instruction that comes alongside um, our general ed teachers and, and either kind of pre-teaches or reteaches or teaches um, uh, the content at, at a level appropriate for that student. So um, that is not a concern that I would have mm -hmm. with this math adoption is that we're going to leave our our students with special needs behind and if I thought it I would let you know I so know. yes um, I think that um, I think we'll be able to 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 reach their needs wonderful yes thank Perfect. you okay clarifying the motion to adjourn pain. motion to adjourn second yay all in favor aye, aye. okay thank you thank all you. for staying